This case takes place in Hampshire, England, on the 17th of July, 2022. Shea Groves was a 27-year-old woman who lived in Haven, a town in the south of England. She was a mother of one, although was not with the father. She had a boyfriend named Frankie Fitzgerald. Frankie was a 25-year-old man from Portsmouth, and he was a father too. She was described as a rather manipulative woman. Her friends would let her say that she would do whatever it took to get her own way, even if that meant blackmailing someone. On one occasion, she had even told Frankie and some of her friends that she had cancer. This was a lie, and had claimed this to garner sympathy and control over people. Shea had somewhat of an obsession with Frankie, and the main reason for this was because of their bedroom life. Both Frankie and Shea would engage in bondage, dominance, submission, and masochism. They would engage in something called knife play, where Frankie would hold blades to Shea's throat. The two had a very off and on relationship. They were both extremely jealous and paranoid about each other cheating. The couple's relationship seemed to be coming to an end. Frankie in particular was becoming sick of Shea's manipulative behaviour, and she was paranoid that he was going to go back to his ex-girlfriend, something that she often spoke about to her friends. The two were also known to drink heavily and take illegal substances, and on the 16th of July 2022, the two had consumed a fair amount. On the 17th of July 2022, the police received a rather strange call from a woman named Vicky Baitup. Vicky told the operators that she had just had a FaceTime conversation with a friend of hers named Shea Groves. Vicky stated that the call began with the two of them speaking about their plans for the weekend, but during this call, Vicky overheard Shea's housemate, Lauren White, say, Are you going to tell her? Shea then explained that she had a really big secret and begged Vicky not to say anything to anyone. Confused, Vicky stayed on the first time with Shea as she began walking up the stairs and into her bedroom. She pointed the camera at the bed, showing Vicky the dead body of her boyfriend, Frankie. As she pointed the camera to Frankie's body, she said, I've done him in, and then began to laugh. Her pillow was covering Frankie's face and a number of bin bags were underneath his body. Vicky was deeply disturbed but the situation was so strange and the camera wasn't close enough to see. She assumed it must have been some kind of sick prank. Vicky asked Shea, are you having me on? But then Shea moved the camera closer and closer and showed a deep cut across Frankie's throat. Vicky would later say, I don't think I really grasped what happened earlier. The gash was so deep, it was enormous. She told Vicky that Frankie had forced himself upon her and that she was a victim of a non-consensual act. To prove this, she sent three video clips as proof. This proof that Frankie had attacked She will be explained later, as there is much more to the story. She then asked Vicky, We're still friends, aren't we? Before ending the call. Following this call, Vicky immediately called the police, explained the first time that she had just had with Shea, and told them where she lived. Officers were dispatched to the house and were met with a strong smell of bleach. The initial interaction with the police was captured by an officer's body camera. I shall now play you that clip. What's going on? Sorry, no, no, no. Don't close the door. What's going on? What's going on? With what? You Shea? I am Shay. Right. Had some kind of strange, interesting call about somebody having had their throat slit. Okay. So what's going on here? No, that's, that a dog, that's is it? my dog, yeah. Hello. You're under arrest just, on suspicion oh, no. of murder. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned, something which you later rely on in court, anything you do say may be given in evidence. The necessity for your arrest is for a prompt and effective investigation. Oh, okay. You can see from the footage that she seems to be oddly relaxed. She goes on to tell the police that she didn't know what happened, and said, He's dead. He's in my room, and it's a mess. The knife I used is in the sink. She was arrested and charged with murder. She's flatmate, Lauren White, was initially arrested on suspicion of murder too, but was released on bail. 
She was, however, charged for failing to give investigating police officers the pin to her mobile phone. A post-mortem was conducted on Frankie's body. They found that he had been stabbed 17 times to the front of the chest, twice to the other chest areas, and three times to the neck. He suffered multiple perforations to the heart and lungs, and had lost a catastrophic amount of blood. When the police examined Shea's home, they discovered that she seemed to have an intense obsession with serial killers. But not in the usual way, where people just find them interesting and watch documentaries. She had a number of framed portraits of notorious killers, including Ted Bundy, Myra Hindley, the Moors murderers, and Jeffrey Dahmer, and had displayed these on her bedroom wall. The police asked Shea to explain exactly what happened. She claimed that she was in fear for her life, that Frankie had attempted to hurt her, and she said she acted in self-defense. She said that the two had a very on and off relationship filled with arguments, and that the two would always film their bedroom activities. She claimed that she had footage of Frankie forcing himself on her and attacking her, and that because of this, she needed to defend herself. The police investigated these claims. Shea had sent three videos to one of her friends, which appeared to show Frankie forcing himself on her. But the police dug a little bit deeper into this. They found her claims to be false. The two had a very extreme sex life, and the footage always seemed to be on the cusp of unconsensual. However, Shea would tell Frankie that she wanted it a certain way, and would then edit the videos in a way to seem like he had acted in a non-consensual manner. The police found the unedited video. In this video, the two talked about a safe word and had engaged in knife play and role play. When the videos were edited, it seemed that Frankie had done what Shea had claimed, but she had obviously manipulated the situation. When confronted with this evidence, Shea eventually admitted that she lied about this story, and the trial would begin in February of 2023. The prosecutor showed how Shea had a deep fascination with serial killers and murder documentaries, and showed the many portraits on her wall, and went on to say, This meant that Shea was familiar with what to do and say to try and engineer a situation where she could look like a victim which of course, completely unraveled in the face of the evidence collected from key witnesses, mobile phones, call data, and recordings. It also came out that she had blackmailed another boyfriend with an intimate tape. She had threatened to show the video to his new girlfriend if he didn't do what she wanted, and what she wanted was a lift into the town centre. In Shea's eyes, this was enough of a reason to blackmail an ex-partner. She had also attacked her housemate Lauren a number of times. On one occasion, she attacked her with a pair of nail clippers and split her head open. The court also heard how She had lied about the reason for killing Frankie and presented evidence which proved that she was lying with the recordings. They also showed how she had began to clean up the crime scene and try to get away with the murder. It was then time for She to present her defense. She said that the two were extremely paranoid and claimed that on the night of the murder, they had both accused each other of talking to their ex-partners. This was backed up by text messages sent by the both of them. With these suspicions, the two swapped phones and checked each other's messages. She claimed that while she was looking through Frankie's phone, she discovered messages from a 13-year-old girl. She then said, at that point, I called him some really horrible names, like the P-word. Frankie then became really angry, and his demeanor changed. She went on to say, You could see it in his eyes. He grabbed me by the throat and forcibly pushed my head towards the headboard. I couldn't breathe, and I couldn't even scream. My eyes were blurry. I realized that he wasn't going to let go, and I feared for my life. I reached out and grabbed an object on the bookcase and hit him in the throat. She explained that she had a money box next to her bed and that she thought she had hit him with that, but claimed that she had accidentally picked up a knife by mistake and slashed his throat. 
Shea continued to say. He rolled off and he stood up and slid down the wall really slowly. There was bubbling coming out of his neck when he stopped moving and I was in shock. His chest wasn't moving, it was just the noise. When that happened, I realized that I had killed him. I tried to stop the bubbling and I put my hand there, but it didn't do anything. So I picked up the knife again and stabbed him in the heart. It was at this point that Shea claimed to have panicked and made a call to her daughter's father, who allegedly told her to clean up the crime scene. Shea then told Lauren that she wanted to bury the body in the garden or make it look like Frankie had taken his own life. Shea and Lauren placed bin bags and shopping bags underneath his body and placed a pillow over his face. Shea then warned her that she was an accomplice who had helped place bin bags underneath his body. It was backed up in court that Frankie did have a history of domestic violence. He had been convicted of harming his previous partner before meeting Shea. The woman Shea FaceTimed after the murder, Vicky, admitted that she and Shea would often talk about ways that they could harm Frankie, such as arranging for people to beat him up. Vicky claimed that she didn't think Shea was being serious and thought these conversations were a joke. The prosecution team highlighted that this showed some signs of premeditation. The prosecution rejected claims that the murder was a crime of passion and stated, She stabbed her boyfriend in a jealous frenzy and then set about trying to cover for herself. Her actions were cold, callous and calculated. She spun a web of lies and everything she did was an attempt to further manipulate the situation and attract from taking any responsibility for her crime. The prosecution team also highlighted that there were no defensive injuries on Frankie's body, which shows that no struggle took place, suggesting strongly that she killed him in his sleep. It was also found that Frankie had blocked the girl who had messaged him prior to the murder. The judge also confirmed that the girl was 17 years old and not 13. Police also uncovered that Shea had been sleeping with her former boyfriend, which was filmed. Frankie would go over to Shea's house after, totally unaware that her ex had been over too. After Shea and Frankie would finish being intimate, she would often accuse him of having no love for her and just using her for convenience. This was used to show how manipulative Shea could be. The jury found Shea guilty of murder and rejected her defense claims. The judge overseeing the case stated what they thought happened. They went into graphic detail about the things Frankie and Shea would get up to in the bedroom and how violent and borderline non-consensual it could be. The judge said, This was a crime of passion. You loved the man you killed, and you killed the man you loved. You are, as the Crown submitted, manipulative, jealous, and possessive. A crime of passion is not committed in cold blood. You realized your relationship with Frankie was ending, and you were losing your influence over him. You sensed that he was going to leave you for a less toxic girlfriend. You were planning for that already, considering resuming your relationship with your ex-partner. But then, you became furious on finding the messages between Frankie and the supposed 13-year-old girl. You lost your temper and acted upon your impulses. If you could not have Frankie, no one could. No other woman could have him, if not you. The judge highlighted some mitigating factors. They didn't believe the murder was premeditated and also brought up the fact that Shea had a troubled upbringing. She suffered from mental health problems from an early age and suffers from emotionally unstable personality disorder and with complex post-traumatic stress disorder from a previous relationship. She was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 23 years. It's said that she showed little to no remorse for what she had done to Frankie. I'm unsure if Shea's housemate, Lauren White, was given a sentence. It's written in court documents that Lauren didn't have many friends and was used as a domestic servant by Shea. She would make her get her clothes ready, put on her socks, make her food and cups of coffee. And as I said before, 
was violent towards her on a number of occasions. If you know anything about what happened to her, please feel free to comment below. And parts of her body were eaten. This case takes place in the United States of America on the 11th of September 2014. Tammy Jo Blanton was a 46-year-old woman who lived in Jeffersonville, Indiana. In 2014, Tammy began a relationship with a man named Joseph Oberhansley. She would later say that at first, the relationship was going well, but after just a few weeks, Joseph began to change. Joseph had a rather dark past. Tammy was aware that he had been incarcerated for a crime that he committed, but she did not know the full ins and outs of exactly what happened. Most of the time, he would brush off the reason for his prison time, but the reason was incredibly sinister. In 1998, when Joseph was 18, he was dating a 17-year-old named Sabrina. The two had a child together, although Joseph was under the impression that she had cheated and the child wasn't his. On the 9th of December 1998, only days after the birth of their child, Sabrina went over to Joseph's mother's house to visit without him. On this day, Joseph had taken a large amount of illegal substances and made his way over to his mother's house. Upon entering, he was enraged to see Sabrina standing there. In response, Joseph pulled out a gun and fired. He shot Sabrina as she held their child. Joseph's mother then jumped in front of Sabrina and the child, but Joseph opened fire on her too and shot a bullet in her back. Joseph then turned and fired a shot at his sister, who was also present, but thankfully, the bullet missed her. After shooting his girlfriend and his own mother, Joseph turned the weapon on himself. He placed it under his chin and fired. Sabrina tragically died from her injury. The baby, however, did manage to survive, along with Joseph's mother. She was treated for her injuries and was able to make a recovery. The bullet that Joseph had fired into his own head became lodged in his brain, and he too was able to make a recovery. Once he recovered, he was charged with murder and attempted murder. At the trial, Joseph's defense team argued that he wasn't guilty of murder. His father and brother had recently passed away, and he had turned to alcohol and other substances to cope. They argued that these circumstances had caused a great deal of stress in his life and that because of this, the crime should be seen as manslaughter instead. The defense team was successful, and Joseph was found guilty of manslaughter in the year 2000. In July of 2012, after serving 12 years, Joseph was released from prison on parole. Joseph headed for Indiana to join his mother, who forgave him shortly after he had shot her. During his time in prison, she even advocated for his release. However, it wouldn't take too long for Joseph to commit another crime. Whilst on parole in 2013, Joseph went to a bar. Whilst drinking, he got into a fight with a fellow patron and ended up choking this man out. Multiple sources have claimed that he resisted arrest and was even naked during this attack. Despite his previous conviction, Joseph was allowed to be released on bail. And because he was released on bail, he met Tammy. So now, we arrive back to 2014. As I said earlier, Joseph and Tammy were in a relationship, but shortly into this relationship, Joseph began to change. He became controlling and aggressive. But then, Tammy confided with a friend and told this friend that Joseph had done something truly horrific. On the 5th of September, Joseph held her captive in her home and repeatedly forced himself upon her for two days. Because she was so scared of Joseph, she did what he wanted, as to not anger him further. This occurred around four months into their relationship. Once she was away from Joseph after being held captive, she ended the relationship, but Joseph wouldn't take no for an answer. Following the breakup, he continued to harass Tammy and would often show up at her home and her work, which of course greatly intimidated her. Some text messages would later be found on Tammy's phone, which were sent to Joseph. The messages go as follows. You can choose to be in denial about what happened on Saturday into Sunday. I won't be in denial. 
No one, and I mean no one, gets to terrify me like you did on Sunday. I will never forget it as long as I live. She went on to say, I do not want to involve the police, but if you leave me no choice, that is what I will have to do. Tammy called her father and asked him to change the locks on her home. Meanwhile, not feeling safe, Tammy stayed at one of her friend's houses for a couple of days. Once the locks were changed, she returned home and told her friends that she had the police on speed dial and kept chairs under the door handles of her house. At 3am on September the 11th, 2014, Tammy awoke and heard the sounds of someone trying to break into her home. Of course, she knew exactly who this would be. She called 911 to say that her ex-boyfriend was trying to break in. The police soon arrived on the scene and told Joseph that he needed to move along. Joseph did as he was told and the police watched him walk away. The police were content that no arrest had to be made and the issue, as far as they were concerned, was settled. The following morning rolled around. Colleagues of Tammy clocked that she was late for work, but as more time passed, they became deeply concerned. Tammy was nowhere to be seen, and from what I can tell, she wasn't known to skip work and not call in as to why. The colleagues that worked with Tammy were very well aware of the troubles Joseph had been causing her. They began to assume that something was horribly wrong. So, they contacted the police and asked them to go over to Tammy's house and check on her to see if everything was okay. Officers were dispatched to the location and arrived on the scene. They approached the house believing that what they would be dealing with was a simple welfare check. However, when officers arrived at Tammy's house, they found Joseph outside and they noted that he seemed to be nervous. An officer also spotted that Joseph seemed to have cuts on his knuckles. As they inspected further, the door to Tammy's house appeared to have been kicked in. Now also concerned, officers told Joseph that they needed to pat him down to make sure that he didn't have any weapons that could potentially harm them. Upon asking this request, Joseph declined, so the officers had no other choice but to arrest Joseph and search him. During this search, they pulled out a knife from his pocket, and this knife was covered in blood. One of the officers later testified that she entered the home through the back door that had been kicked in. She found a trail of blood throughout the house, all over the walls, the floor, everywhere. They then entered the bathroom of the house. Inside, a tent covered the bathtub. They pulled back the tent and found Tammy's body in the tub. Her body had been horrendously mutilated and she was missing a large part of her skull. Investigators were brought in to determine what exactly happened and Joseph was taken into custody. When examining the crime scene and Tammy's body, investigators made a number of truly horrific and disturbing discoveries. Tammy had been stabbed dozens of times and had suffered severe blunt force trauma. An electrical power tool had been used to cut inside her body, and other tools were used to open up her chest, one of them being an electrical saw. Joseph had then used a knife to cut and remove parts of her lung and entire heart. Tammy's skull had also been cut with the power saw. Large chunks of her brain had been removed, some of which was found in the bathtub with her, along with large chunks of her skull. As Tammy's house was inspected, they discovered that part of her organs that were missing were found on a dinner plate next to the frying pan. Joseph had cooked and cannibalized Tammy. He had eaten parts of her brain, lung, and heart. Joseph was questioned. During this interview with the police, he explained that he had indeed eaten Tammy's brain and that he had also tried to pull out her third eye with tongs. He also admitted to eating large parts of her lungs and heart. Investigators asked where Tammy's heart was. He replied by saying, I ate it. It's part of me now. He was questioned as to why he ate her body. Joseph said, she was already dead. After this interview, he was placed in a padded cell where he began to beat his chest and pant heavily. To commit such a gruesome crime usually means that the perpetrator is severely mentally ill. 
Mental health professionals began the lengthy process of determining if Joseph was mentally competent enough to stand trial. In the meantime, Joseph would change his story. He said that his head had been fuzzy following the murder of Tammy because he too had been attacked. So, this is his second story. According to Joseph, he had gone to Tammy's house to collect some belongings. But upon entering her house, he had found two men who had broken in. Upon seeing Joseph, these two men supposedly attacked him and rendered him unconscious. He claimed that these two men had stabbed, killed and eaten Tammy. Joseph also said that he believed the two men were planning to cut his head off and eat his brain. Joseph was charged with murder. After some time, and after being assessed by multiple professionals, Joseph was deemed not mentally fit to stand trial in 2017. Joseph was then given medical and psychological treatment, and in 2018 he was deemed fit to stand trial, nearly four years after the crime had been committed. The trial would begin in 2019. This trial, however, wouldn't last long. One of the jury members was aware of Joseph's past. To have a fair trial, the jury was supposed to have no prior knowledge of his manslaughter conviction. This jury member spoke to a number of other jury members and told them what he had done previously. When the courts found out about this, the trial was ruled as a mistrial. A new trial would need to be set up. However, this again would take some time. The courts needed the go-ahead from mental health professionals that Joseph was fit again to stand trial. During this time, Joseph was offered an insanity plea, but Joseph declined to take it. He said to the judge that using the insanity defense would be in part amount to admitting guilt to the jurors, and said, I don't suffer from any mental illness. A second trial would begin in September of 2020, six years after the death of Tammy. During the trial, the jury was shown a number of photographs of the crime scene, and were shown evidence that Joseph had consumed some of her brain, lungs, and heart. Before the jury were presented with these images, they were warned how graphic and gruesome they were, and were described as worse than anything you would see in a horror film. Joseph took to the stand and claimed that two black men had broken into Tammy's house and that they were the ones responsible for her death. When asked about the initial confession, Joseph stated that he had been coerced by investigators to confess and claimed that when he was being questioned, he was in a vulnerable state of mind. The defense then warned the jury not to be distracted from the facts of the case by, quote, emotional evidence. The prosecution stated that Joseph's story of intruders was a fabrication, and that he and he alone was responsible for the death and cannibalization of Tammy. The prosecutor said, she suffered so many indignities that night. She was terrified, she was stabbed, she was dismembered, and she was eaten, all at the hands of Joseph. One of Tammy's friends also testified. She spoke of the horrific weekend Tammy had suffered at the hands of Joseph in the week before the murder. Messages were shown to the court from Tammy's phone, where she confided with this friend, highlighting how she was scared of him. The 911 call placed by Tammy in the early hours of the morning before her murder was also brought up, showing that Joseph had already tried to break into her house that morning. A psychologist that assessed Joseph testified and stated that he was the most severely mentally ill person who she had ever reviewed. Joseph's defense told the court that he had a bullet lodged in his brain and that this was a major cause for his mental health issues. They went on to claim that this should be taken into account when finding him guilty or not guilty of murder. Joseph was thankfully found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As he was removed from court, he continued to insist that he was innocent. What is incredibly frustrating about this case is that Joseph has proven himself to be a serious danger to society not once, but twice. Yet, his lawyers are helping him to get a retrial and have launched an appeal. His defense lawyer said, It would be easy to look at the horrors visited upon Tammy and conclude that they were simply the actions of a monster, but doing so would be reductive, and this court's review must look deeper. The court must consider his actions in the context of his profound mental illness. They went on to say, 
There is also no question that Joseph was suffering from severe mental illness when he committed his crimes. What there is a question about, however, is whether Tammy would still be alive today if Joseph were not so severely mentally ill. There are reasons to believe that she would. Because of that, Joseph asks this court to find his sentence of life without parole inappropriate. End quote. As far as I can tell, these proceedings are ongoing. I would sometimes like to ask these lawyers who try to get such reoffending murderers off if they would ever like to live next door to them. The chances are, they wouldn't. But if they were ever to somehow get a reoffending murderer out, someone would have to live next door to them. And just like how Tammy was unaware of his past, they could be too. As I mentioned earlier, in 2013, whilst Joseph was on parole, he choked someone out whilst he was naked and was allowed to be released on bail. The prosecutor who allowed this bail to go through resigned from his position following the death of Tammy. The case of Tammy is by far one of the most gruesome true crime cases out there. The horror of what happened to her is only compounded by just how long it took for Joseph to be brought to justice. Something that must have been horrendous for Tammy's family and for those who cared about her. The police who worked on this case have said that the crime scene was one of the most gruesome in Jeffersonville's history. I'm guessing many of you have likely heard of Ivan Milat, quite possibly one of the most notorious Australian criminals. If you haven't, then I shall give a brief summary, as this case will be focusing on somebody else. Ivan Milat was found guilty of murdering two men and five women in Australia between 1989 and 1992. The bodies were discovered in Belangelo State Forest, a 9,400 acre wood in New South Wales. Ivan is often referred to as the backpacker killer due to his victims being backpackers. It is also believed that he killed many more people. Although he did proclaim his innocence till the day he passed away from cancer aged 74. What some people don't know is that Ivan had a great nephew named Matthew and Matthew idolized his great uncle. He had plans to make the family name even more notorious than it already was. This case takes place in New South Wales, Australia, on the 20th of November, 2010. Matthew Millman was born in December of 1993, and as I said earlier, was the great nephew of Ivan Millat. Those who knew Matthew would later say that he would often brag to people about who his uncle was, and would even tell them shortly after meeting them. He would also enjoy going to the Balangalo State Forest, so he could look at the memorial dedicated to the victims, taking pride in what his uncle had done. After the murders of Ivan came to light, a number of his family members decided to change their last names as to no longer be associated with such a twisted individual. Matthew, on the other hand, was disappointed that he didn't share the name, so he changed his second name to Milat. Many people who knew of Matthew were of course very wary of him, but despite being a rather unsavory individual, Matthew did have some friends and hung around with a group of lads. And one of these lads was 16-year-old David Occioloni. David was described as a popular young man who could on occasion be a little too trusting of people that he should be wary of, and Matthew was one of those people. David's grandma recalled a time when she saw an altercation between David and Matthew outside her home. She ran out and told Matthew to leave. Matthew walked up to her, got in her face, and tried to intimidate her before turning around and leaving. She said that after this, on a number of occasions, Matthew would drive past her house in an attempt to scare her. But as I said, David could be a little too trusting, so he and Matthew made up shortly after this. And now, we arrive to the 20th of November, 2010. This day was David's 17th birthday. He woke up that morning and spent the day with his mother and grandparents. He had a couple of beers with his grandfather and enjoyed some birthday cake. Later on into the afternoon, David had plans to meet some of his friends. These friends were Cohen Klein, Chase Day, and Matthew Malat. 
The four went to grab something to drink and smoke. Matthew then told the group that they should all go to the Balangalo State Forest so the police wouldn't be able to stop them from drinking. And so they did. They all got into a car and began driving to the forest. The plan was to go and enjoy some drinks together to celebrate David's birthday, but Matthew had a far more sinister plan. That night, David didn't come home. At the time, he was living with his grandparents. They were concerned about him and tried to contact him, but when he failed to come home in the following days, they contacted the police and reported David missing. However, it wouldn't take long to find out what exactly had happened. On the 22nd of November, Chase Day spoke to his father. He told him that something truly horrific had happened to David and that he needed to come clean. His father brought him into the station and he began talking with investigators. Chase told them that Matthew had killed David in an incredibly cruel and brutal way. The story he told goes as follows. On the 20th, the four drove into the forest in Matthew's car. Once in the forest, Matthew got out of the car and walked towards the boot. He then shouted for David to come out and join him at the rear of the car. Chase then recalled hearing David scream. Matthew had hit David in the ribs with a large double-sided axe. He witnessed David run around the car away from Matthew, who was still wielding the weapon. David pleaded with Matthew not to harm him, but he didn't want to listen. Chase then got out of the car and pleaded with Matthew to stop hurting David, but he was powerless to stop him. Matthew turned around and began to swear at him, telling him to get back into the car and mind his own business. Matthew got David onto the ground and began toying with him. He made him lie down face into the dirt and accused him of talking about him behind his back. As David pleaded with Matthew, he swung the axe down upon him a number of times. After killing him, Matthew dragged his body into the bush to hide him. After hiding the body, Matthew got back into the car with Chase and Cohen and proceeded to drive home. Chase recalled Matthew being incredibly excited at what he had done. Matthew told them that killing David was such a rush for him. Shortly after this horrific confession, both Matthew and Cohen were arrested and brought into the station for questioning. Meanwhile, a search team was set out to find David. It didn't take them long to find his body. David's grandparents were then tasked with identifying David's body. Cohen was questioned and right away he tried to play the victim. He said he did indeed witness the crime taking place, but that he was terrified of Matthew and could do nothing to stop him. The investigators weren't quite convinced of his innocence. His home was searched, and there they found a mobile phone. This device was soon to be searched. Meanwhile, Matthew was also being questioned, but he refused to speak and just said no comment. His home was also searched, and there they found a pair of shoes that had blood on them. These shoes were later tested, and it was confirmed that the blood was David's. Both Matthew and Cohen were charged with murder, and Chase was charged as an accessory. The mobile that was found in Cohen's home was thoroughly searched, and on it, the police found a deleted file. The file was recovered, and it turned out it was a recording of the final moments of David's life. They found out that Matthew taunted him for some time before killing him, reveling in David's fear and accusing him of things that he had never done. They also found that Chase was telling the truth. While Cohen filmed what was happening, Chase did try to stop it. He begged Matthew to stop hurting David, but this resulted in Matthew becoming angry. As long as Matthew had the axe, Chase could do nothing, so he just got back into the car as he was told. An extract from the recording recovered from Cohen's mobile phone goes as follows. Matthew, look at the dirt. Don't look at me, look at the dirt. David begins to cry. Matthew, keep looking at me and I'll cut your head off. Look at the ground. Tell me, is it true you've been going around telling people about my affairs? David, it's not true, Matt. Matthew, shut up. 
Put your hands down next to your face. Are you going to keep meddling with me? David. No, I won't. I swear to God. Matthew. How do I know that? David. We've been mates for ages. My word is good. I swear to God to you, dude. I never said anything about you. Matthew. I really don't believe you, all right? David. Man, I give you my word. I would not. Matthew. Yeah, you've given me your word, and your word isn't good enough. It's after this exchange that the sound of the axe hitting David's head can be heard, and then the recording ends. The murder and the 15 minutes leading up to it was hauntingly captured on an audio recording from Cohen's mobile phone. David was being submissive the entire time and tried his best to defuse the situation. Following this revelation, the charges against Chase were dropped and he was asked to give evidence at the trial to which he agreed. Before the trial would take place, the investigators recovered the murder weapon from a body of water inside the forest. Matthew was also evaluated by a mental health professional. It was found that he suffered from no conditions that would have caused him to commit such a horrific crime. The trial began, and it's said that Matthew showed little emotion and just kept his head down. It's one of the most notorious names in our criminal history. Now, the Millat family has another killer in its ranks. Matthew Millat, a relative of Ivan the serial killer, killed a mate in the Belanglo State Forest. The same place his uncle tortured and executed seven backpackers. Today, for the first time, we can show you the face of teenage murderer Matthew Malat. Cohen Klein is his mate, and both have pleaded guilty to the axe murder of their one-time friend, David Octoloni. David's family fronted court today as a judge decides the penalty for the killers. It was David's birthday, November 20 in 2010, when Malat and Klein lured him into the Belangelo State Forest the same killing fields used by Matthew's uncle, Ivan Malat. Both Matthew and Cohen were found guilty of murder. No motive for what happened was found. It just seemed that Matthew wanted to kill. Matthew was sentenced to 43 years in prison. He has since tried to appeal his sentence, but so far he has been unsuccessful. Cohen was sentenced to at least 22 years with a maximum 32-year term. He too has appealed his sentence, and he was successful. His sentence was reduced from 32 to 27 years. When speaking about the horrific murder of David, his grandfather said, They didn't just kill him, they tormented him. The love I have for David, and the hatred I have for those animals who took him away, they deserve no mercy. What is incredibly eerie about this case is that during the sentencing hearing, it was revealed that Matthew had written poems during his time in custody. One poem, called Your Last Day, goes as follows. Click clack, hear that, stopping in the middle of the track. Are you getting nervous in the back? You should be, you're getting whacked. Talk shit here, talk shit there, no one's really gonna care. But talk shit with every breath, you just signed away your health. I can see you start to sweat, wondering what you're gonna get. Hoping for one in the head, I'll put one in your leg. Tell me, are you having fun? Get up and start to run. How far are you gonna get? Your match you have just met. Stumbling all over the place, hear the crunch of leaves and feet, your heart will skip a beat. Are you gonna get away? No hope, kid, this ain't your day. The day that you won't be found, six feet underneath the ground. Matthew takes a great delight in the crimes he had committed, and is now referred to as the Copycat Millat. A video on Ivan Millat is soon to come. This case takes place in Blackpool, England, on the 1st of November, 2003. Charlene Downs was a 14-year-old girl who lived in Blackpool with her mother, father, brother, and two sisters. The life of Charlene is a rather tragic one, and one that is hard to listen to, especially for those who have experienced SA. It seems that she never really had a chance in life, but we shall get into that later. 
An old close friend of Charlene, who knew her very well, described her as a lovely and caring girl. However, he said that when she was around 12 years old, her personality changed. She became more reckless and rebellious. Charlene's older sister is named Rebecca. At the time of this story taking place, she was 16 years of age. Out of all of the siblings, it's reported that Charlene and Rebecca were the closest and considered each other to be best friends. Rebecca moved out of the family home when she was 14 years old and moved into a house that was owned by a 50-year-old man. Rebecca has claimed that she and this 50-year-old man were not in a relationship. However, many who knew her at the time have stated that this is untrue and that she was indeed in a relationship with this older man. Despite moving out, Rebecca and Charlene still remained very close. Rebecca Downs had moved out of the family home as soon as she could. This was because her father, Bob Downs, was known to be incredibly violent. If his children misbehaved, he would beat them, especially if he had had a couple of beers. Also, some very, very unsavory characters would often stay at the Downs' household as guests. But we shall talk about this in depth further on. Charlene too was a victim of Bob's anger and violence. In fact, the Downs family had moved from the West Midlands to Blackpool in 1999. This was because both Karen and Bob risked losing their children as they had been investigated by the social services due to neglect, abuse and multiple predators staying in the family's home. The authorities wanted to place the children into the care system. On the 1st of November 2003, Charlene awoke at around 10am. She got ready for the day and met her sister Rebecca. The two spent the day walking the streets, in the arcades and in McDonald's. At around 6.45pm that night, Charlene and Rebecca were walking towards Church Street which is in Blackpool Town Centre. During this time, their mother, Karen Downs, was handing out leaflets for a local restaurant. The three happened to bump into each other and spoke briefly. Rebecca told Karen and Charlene that she was going home and asked Charlene if she wanted to come with her. However, Charlene said that she wanted to meet some friends instead. So, off Rebecca went alone. Karen walked with Charlene to a payphone where she called some of her friends telling them to come and meet her. Karen stayed with Charlene until these friends arrived. Once the friends came, Karen told Charlene not to be home too late before going their separate ways. Now, what happened from this point on is a little unclear. Charlene and these friends spent some time together. She then met another friend and went to the carousel bar situated on the North Pier. Footage would be found much later of what appears to be Charlene walking with an unidentified woman at around 9pm. The area in which Charlene is walking was known for the selling of illegal substances and is where working women were known to hang out. Charlene then meets other friends and hangs around the town centre before making her way towards an alley on Abingdon Street. Charlene was spotted around this alleyway at around 10 to 11pm. It was the last time she would ever be seen again. When Charlene didn't make it home that night, Karen became concerned. However, she would later claim that she didn't worry too much. Charlene was 14, an age when teenagers are known to rebel and put this down for the reason for her not coming home on time. Hours and days would pass. Charlene's parents didn't report Charlene missing for two whole days. When Karen phoned the police, she stated that Charlene had been missing since 8 o'clock on the Saturday, which was the 1st of November. She reported Charlene missing on the Monday. Whilst on the phone, the police told Karen that they would send some officers over shortly to gather some information in hopes of being able to locate Charlene quickly. On the phone call, you can hear Karen reply, I can't, I need to go out soon, to which the dispatcher replies in a shocked voice, your daughter is missing and she is 14. You need to stay in and speak to the police. The police went over to the Downs' household and gathered information about Charlene, who she was with when she disappeared, what she was wearing and where she was known to hang around. At first, the police put this case down as a runaway child 
They assumed that Charlene would soon turn up once she ran out of money or missed her home, but this wasn't what happened. The police contacted the local media and told them not to publish the story of Charlene's disappearance, claiming that this was just another runaway story and she would be back soon. Although, after some more time passed with no leads, Charlene's mother contacted the media and asked them to publish an article along with a recent photograph of Charlene, which the media did. This is when Karen learned that the police told the media not to publish the story. The police received a large number of calls and tips from various people, all claiming to have seen Charlene in the days since her disappearance, one even claiming that they had seen her dead by a railway track. However, the vast majority of these tips did not lead to anything of significance. It soon became apparent that something was horribly wrong. When the police questioned Karen and Bob, they discovered that living with the family was a man named Ray Monroe. As I mentioned earlier, some very unsavory characters were living in the house, and Ray was one of them. Ray is a convicted predator. He was found guilty during the time he was living with the family, and three days after Charlene vanished, he was sentenced and jailed after he pleaded guilty to three counts of indecent assault and essaying a six-year-old boy. Ray was jailed for four years after pleading guilty. Bob has always insisted that he had no idea that Ray had pleaded guilty to these horrific crimes claiming that he only found out about his crimes when he was sat in court during Ray's trial, three days after Charlene had disappeared. The police began to suspect that perhaps Bob and Karen had a hand in Charlene's disappearance. Investigators also discovered the reason why the Downs family had moved from the West Midlands to Blackpool. When Charlene was just nine years of age, she had accused a friend of Bob and Karen's of forcing themselves on her, among other things. When social services became involved, Bob and Karen moved and were somehow able to slip under the radar. If Charlene were to be found, or if she ever came back, it was decided by the authorities that she would be put into their care system. However, this was never to happen. Years went by with no trace of Charlene. It also became clear to the police that Charlene, along with many other young girls, would frequent some of the local kebab shops, where they would do sexual favours for the owners and workers in return for money, cigarettes and alcohol. It's reported that Charlene had over 100 contacts. Men all over Blackpool would pay Charlene to perform acts on them for money. Charlene was one of over 60 girls in Blackpool who were being exploited by the takeaway owners who operated in a ring, amongst various other predators. The youngest of these girls was 11. However, the police would keep this quiet until 2011. The next big development would occur in 2006. A man by the name of David Cassidy came forward to the police with some information. He stated that two men were responsible for the murder of Charlene, Mohamed Raveshi and Ayad Albatiki. Raveshi was a 55-year-old takeaway owner and a foster parent to many children. Albatiki was 28 years old and was business partners with Raveshi. David Cassidy claimed to have heard that Raveshi had a number of young girls hanging around his home and his takeaway. David also claimed that Raveshi had been found inside his bed with three young naked girls, one of them being Charlene Downs. He also said he had heard that Charlene had performed oral acts on Albatiki in exchange for money. David Cassidy was described as a businessman. He had a slot machine arcade and supplied slot machines to takeaways. He was very familiar with many of the owners. The story that he told the police was that Charlene was a victim of exploitation and that she had told Raveshi and Albatiki that she was going to the police to turn them in because she was sick of being used by them. David claimed that he received this information from Albatiki's brother. The story was that Albatiki had killed Charlene and acquired help from Raveshi to dispose of the body. Based on these accusations from David Cassidy, Albatiki and Raveshi were detained and brought in. They were questioned and asked if they knew anything about the disappearance of Charlene Downs. 
The two men claimed that they had no idea who Charlene even was. Whilst the two men were detained by the authorities, the police went to Ravesh's home and installed a number of secret recording devices, along with a recording device in Ravesh's car. For four weeks, the police listened in on private conversations. A total of 52 tapes were made over the course of the four weeks, and Detective Sergeant Jan Besant was the officer who volunteered to transcribe them. For six hours a day for almost a year, she listened to the tapes and tried to make sense of them. The recording devices in Raveshi's home were planted right near the television set, so static was picked up. This resulted in the audio being extremely poor quality. It's important to note that Jan had no qualifications to make her an expert in transcribing poor quality audio and had no knowledge of linguistic analysis. When speaking about what she heard in the tapes, Jan said, In the first few tapes, clearly they were shocked and worried and panicking. The first thing they talk about is this murder inquiry. In the recordings, Jan heard the two men talking about a burial place and big bones. A small piece of the transcript is on screen now. In one of the recordings, Jan believes she hears Raveshi say, I can't cope. I'm so worried, and you were the one who killed her. Raveshi then asks, Why did you kill her? Albatiki replies saying, You're being stupid if you thought we'd ever release her. Albatiki was also heard asking how long fingerprints last, to which Raveshi responds, There is nothing left of her. She was here, she died, there really is nothing. Jan also claimed to hear the two men joking about how they had minced up Charlene's body, turned her into kebab meat, and served her flesh to unwitting customers. The two men were arrested and charged with the murder of Charlene Downs. The police spoke with Charlene's parents, Bob and Karen. They informed them of the arrest and told them they were 99% certain that Charlene had been murdered. Although, they didn't actually tell them about the way in which they believed she had been killed. The Downs family would find out when the media began running stories about the murder of Charlene, stating rumours that she had been chopped up and sold as kebab meat. Before telling the Downs family about these disturbing rumours, they had instead fed the media this information for them to distribute. This, of course, was an incredible shock to the family. It goes without saying that the headlines gripped the public. The story of a teenage girl being turned into kebab meat and being cannibalized by unwitting customers spread quickly. The trial would begin in May of 2006. The audio was presented to the court, with a transcription going alongside, informing the court of what the men were saying, along with their witness, David Cassidy. Raveshi owned a number of properties in Blackpool. In his main residence, the investigators looked for any DNA evidence or blood that could prove that Charlene was either there or had been killed there. The prosecution team showed evidence and photographs of the home, showing that a number of floorboards had been replaced very recently, along with other renovations to the house. Investigators had also noted that the place was unusually clean, like it had been scrubbed. No DNA evidence was found that belonged to Charlene. Albertiki and Raveshi's defense team managed to convince the judge that David's testimony was merely hearsay and was not reliable, pointing to the fact that David had a long criminal history. The audio quality of the recordings was also contested. The defense argued that it was too unclear to be a reliable piece of evidence. The judge agreed that the transcript could only be cited as an interpretation and not as fact. The defense team also pushed that the recordings and the transcripts did not match up and that Jan wanted to solve the case so badly that she inserted what she wanted to hear into the transcriptions and were made to fit the narrative. For instance, the words burial place were mistranscribed. What was likely said was Paul's place. A tracker was placed on Raveshi's car. When the police checked to see where Raveshi had gone since the tracker had been placed on his car, they confirmed that he had actually visited his friend Paul. 
No such burial site was ever visited by Raveshi. However, what is rather odd is that both men were indeed talking about the disposal of big bones. Linguistic experts later confirmed that they were talking about bones, and were joking about mincing somebody up in the kebab meat. Both men denied any wrongdoing and proclaimed their innocence. There was no evidence that either of the men had ever met Charlene. Then, a very damning piece of evidence was presented that shattered the prosecution's claims. Investigators had wired up David and gotten him to speak to Albertiki's brother again, Albertiki's brother being the one who told David about this whole story. David did as he was asked and spoke with Albertiki's brother about the alleged murder of Charlene. In this recording, the brother this time claimed that he had no idea what David was talking about. At the end of the recording, David says to the brother, I must have gotten the wrong end of the stick. With these holes in the prosecution's evidence, the case fell through and resulted in a hung jury, meaning that the jury could not all collectively agree whether or not the two men were innocent or guilty. So, they were released. The Downs family were outraged. They believed that the two men were guilty of murdering Charlene, and they still do. However, it was discovered that the two men knew some of the jury members, and so a retrial was set for 2008. But the Crown Prosecution Service found no evidence against the two men, and so this retrial was called off. Because it was claimed that the two men were falsely accused and falsely imprisoned, they both were given £250,000 each in compensation. Although, both men faced further accusations following the trial, with Albertiki being accused of SAing five young women, and Ravishi being accused of abusing a young girl. Neither men were found guilty of any of these crimes. Following the trial, the police were investigated for what was seen as their major mishandling of evidence. It was found that many of the officers were untrained, incompetent, and held strong biases towards the two men. Because of Jan's alleged misinterpretations of the audio, she was ordered to resign following this investigation. In 2007, the police finalised a report about the grooming of young girls by a number of takeaway owners and workers. However, as I said earlier, this only came to light in 2011. In this report, it was said that Charlene had performed oral in exchange for food. The number of girls mentioned in this report was around 60, however this could be a lot higher. Many of these girls were incredibly vulnerable, coming from abusive homes and many in the care system. Now, let's delve a little deeper into the Downs family. A week after the trial had ended, Karen took a knife and stabbed Bob. Bob survived and refused to press charges against Karen, stating that she was just under a lot of pressure due to the trial collapsing. Rumours had been circulating that Bob had been allowing men to have relations with his children in exchange for money. Bob was described as an alcoholic. One theory was that he allowed his children to be used in exchange for money. On many occasions, convicted predators had been found living or staying in Karen and Bob's house. Bob would often go out drinking and invite random men back to the house for more drinks. Allow me to quickly go through some very strange allegations made against Bob and Karen. A leaked court document from 1989 shows that the Downs family had been investigated by the West Midlands Police and the Social Services. This was because a convicted predator had been found to be giving their three-year-old daughter Emma rides in his car. In 1999, it was alleged that some of Bob's friends engaged in inappropriate behaviour with some of the Downs' children. In April of 2001, Charlene told a social worker that one of Bob's friends had touched her inappropriately. In August of 2001, Charlene was found by a social worker lying in bed with a man in his 60s. This incident occurred in the Downs' home in Blackpool. Charlene was then later seen counting some money. And of course, before Charlene vanished, the man I mentioned earlier, Ray Monroe, was living with the family. 
It's reported that many people saw Charlene sitting on Ray's lap inside the Downs' family home. At least 16 males who have committed various offences involving children have had access to the Downs' family home in the West Midlands and in Blackpool over a 15-year period. It's entirely possible that it's more than 16. I do have to make this clear, these are all allegations. Although it is confirmed that Charlene attended a health clinic 12 times, it was noted that she had bruises to her private area on multiple occasions. Karen was aware of these visits to the clinic, however she claimed that she never thought much of it. Charlene's blood was also found in the Downs' household. However, this is something that can be expected, as of course she did live there. I've also seen some reports that claim that the Downs family did not fully cooperate with the police during the beginning of the investigation. The theory is, is that Bob allowed men to come back to his home where he would allow these men to have access to his children in exchange for money so he could buy more booze. One of these men may have either deliberately or accidentally killed Charlene and the parents helped to cover up her death to save themselves. Some people think that Bob may have killed Charlene in a fit of rage. Both Bob and Karen deny having any part in the disappearance of Charlene. A number of other suspects have been questioned by the police over the years. However, nothing has ever come of it. The most recent suspect is a man named Nigel Lloyd. It's said that Nigel knew the Downs family and Charlene. Nigel is a 51-year-old convicted predator. He was found guilty of attacking two young girls between 2001 and 2003 in Blackpool, which was around the time when Charlene was walking the streets. There are also some rumours that the two spoke on the night that Charlene went missing. Nigel's flat also overlooked the alley near the takeaways where Charlene was known to frequent. Nigel was recently arrested and questioned, however, nothing ever came of this either. So. What exactly happened to Charlene Downs? Do you think Albertiki and Raveshi were responsible? Although the recordings were somewhat debunked, many parts of the audio are still very suspicious. Regardless, many people, including the police, believe the two men to be extremely dangerous. Or do you think that the parents had anything to do with her death? The case of Charlene is incredibly tragic. Reading about her early childhood made me feel sick to my stomach. I can already feel that some people will judge Charlene for her behaviour, but I do think it's important to remember and to take into account what she went through when she was younger and the kinds of people who were allowed to live in her home. Detective Chief Superintendent Andy Webster has said, We remain fully committed to finding Charlene's killer and her body. A £100,000 reward remains on offer for information leading to the conviction of her killers or the recovery of her body. If you do know anything about the murder of Charlene Downs, please see the relevant links in the pinned comment. Investigators have taken more than 4,800 witness statements and followed 10,500 lines of inquiry. But the case still remains unsolved. As of the release of this video, Charlene has been missing for just shy of 20 years. This case takes place in Sweden on the 17th of August, 1995. John Horon was a 14-year-old who lived in Kungolv, Sweden. Those who knew John described him as a good-natured young lad and a very promising canoeist. John often competed in various competitions and did very well for himself. In a national competition in the summer of 1995, he was able to win a bronze medal. His success was often written about in local and national news. Due to this success, some of those in his school would become jealous and some would bully him due to their envy. The school that John attended had somewhat of an issue with students that were a part of racist organisations. For example, a number of students were a part of the Swedish White Aryan Resistance. It was these students that would threaten John on a regular basis. 
At the end of the 1980s, a new Nazi movement had developed in Sweden. This movement rapidly expanded during the 1990s and was able to recruit many young people. With mail-order merchandise available, many of these young people hung Nazi propaganda and memorabilia in their rooms. Bullying aside, John had a particular dislike towards these students because of their beliefs. He had a strong dislike for those who engaged in this new wave of Nazism. John's father would later say that these students threatened John for well over a year. However, the school did very little to put an end to the torment. One bully at the school that would often try to intimidate John and had even threatened to kill him was 15-year-old Michael. However, if Michael ever tried anything, John would always stick up for himself and was known to stick up for others too. On the 17th of August 1995, the summer holidays were coming to an end, so John and a good friend of his, Christian, decided to go camping by a lake. Right after finishing putting up their tent, the two teens were relaxing next to a fire, blissfully enjoying their time before school would start again. Although, coincidentally, the bully from John's school, Michael, was also at that very same lake. He was there with three other friends. 18-year-old Daniel Hansen, who was the ringleader of the group, 17-year-old John Billing, and an 18-year-old that was only referred to as BM. All three of Michael's friends were members of Nazi groups, and they had all been drinking heavily. Daniel in particular was known to be extremely violent. He was constantly getting into fights, had hit his girlfriend, and had even been convicted of stabbing someone in his youth. The four happened to see Christian and John's fire from their position at the lake. Michael was told by his older friends to go over and see who was there. Upon seeing John, he ran back to his friends and suggested that they all go over together and attack John. All four agreed. With beers in hand, they walked round to where John and Christian were. One of them, holding a full can of beer, took aim and threw the can into John's face as hard as he could. The four then began to savagely beat him and demanded that he say, I love Nazis. John refused this demand and so they continued to attack him. They punched him, kicked him and stomped on him. One of the attackers would later brag that John was so scared that his eyes were extremely wide and that he was clearly in a great amount of fear. But then, the four helped him up, grabbed him a beer, and began talking to him in a civil manner, apologizing for the beating they had given him. But this was just part of their sick and twisted plan. As they assured John that they would stop, one of the attackers came behind him and punched him in the back of the head. They continued the attack. John could do nothing but try his best to defend himself, an almost impossible feat against four people. Outnumbered and held at knife point, Christian was forced to watch his friend be mercilessly beaten. The attackers then grabbed all of John and Christian's belongings, put them inside the tent, and set the tent alight, destroying absolutely everything. One of them picked up a piece of wood that was on fire and hit John in the back of the neck. The two begged to be let go. The four attackers ignored these pleas and continued to beat John. They would pretend to be sorry, help him up, and then would continue the attack. They did this for hours in what was a truly horrific act of torture. The four then pushed John into the lake. Now fully in the water, John was able to swim away from them. John Billing and BM ran around the other side of the lake so they would be able to grab him if he tried to get out and run. However, Michael and Daniel waited with Christian in case John swam back to that area. John was a strong swimmer and would have had no issue in getting away. But as he was swimming in the water, he heard Michael and Daniel shout to him, we will kill your friend if you don't come back. Christian was then forced to cry out, Please come back or they're going to kill me. John could have swam to safety, far away from his torturers. But upon hearing his friend in need, John swam back to the bank and got out of the water. Once John was back on land again, the two main attackers, 
Daniel and Michael continued to viciously beat him, until John fell to the ground unconscious. Even when he was unconscious, they continued to kick him in the stomach as hard as they could, and repeatedly stomped on his head. They would later say that the violence they were inflicting upon John felt so good that they just couldn't stop. After they were done beating John, and as he lay unconscious on the ground, they rolled him into the lake and watched him as he sank and drowned. Michael and Daniel then met up with the other two that went round the lake and told them that they had thrown John into the water whilst he was unconscious, joking around about how he sank like a stone. The four then packed up and made their way home. They left Christian alone and physically unharmed. Christian managed to make his way to a road and hitched hike home. When he got home in the early hours of the morning, he woke his parents up and told them their devastating news. They contacted the authorities and told them about the horrific murder. Christian was able to tell the police exactly who was responsible, and all four were swiftly arrested. Christian also led the police to the location where they had beaten John and thrown him into the water. John's body was found, and his face was completely unrecognisable. As always, be careful when researching this case. There are some images of John on the internet, and it isn't nice to see. John's parents wanted the images to be made public to show everyone what the four attackers had done to their son. John had been beaten so badly that the coroner said that he had never seen anything like it before, and that it seemed that John had been hit by a car. He had extreme injuries to his head and bleeding on the brain, along with extreme internal injuries and internal bleeding. A number of John's teeth had also been broken. The pain and fear John must have been in in his final moments is just unthinkable. Those who inspected his injuries stated that even if John had not been thrown into the water, he would likely still have died from the beating. The same day they found John's body, the four attackers were questioned by the police. The ringleader, 18-year-old Daniel, was told to describe the events that had taken place the day before. Daniel said, I think his name was John, and denied having any major involvement in the murder of John but he would later admit to his part. The bully from John's school, Michael, spoke to the police and gave a full confession, describing exactly how he and his friends had beaten John, and took part in a reenactment of the murder for the police, even showing them how he and Daniel rolled John's body into the lake. The murder attracted enormous attention, and thousands of people took part in protest marches across the country. On the 22nd of September, 1995, the trial began. Despite pleas from John's parents and the public, the vast majority of the trial was kept behind doors. The media was not given access to report on the details. On the 2nd of October, a verdict was reached. The 18-year-old ringleader, Daniel, was sentenced to eight years in prison for murder. 15-year-old Michael, the bully from John's school, was sentenced to five years for murder. The other two who left the scene before John was killed were found guilty of aggravated assault. One of them was sentenced to 10 months in prison and the other four months in prison. Whilst in prison, Michael was stabbed in the eye with a screwdriver by older neo-Nazis. They did this because he spoke to the police in detail about the murder. And inside prison, Daniel, along with other inmates, formed the Swedish version of the Aryan Brotherhood. When speaking about killing John, Daniel said, I didn't even know John. If it had not been him, it would have been someone else. He then went on to say that he would not have committed the crime if he was sober. As for where these people are now, I couldn't find any information. John's father now keeps a framed portrait of John in the living room in his home. And upstairs, he keeps boxes filled with photographs and newspaper clippings and awards that John won. A movie has also been made about the murder of John, which is available to watch online. In an interview, John's father said, Of course, it would be easier to live if you could just forget. But once you become a dad, you're always a dad. You cannot escape it. 
John's murder has affected my whole life, and they haven't taken just John. It's the grandchildren and the whole piece that has been taken away from us. A non-profit foundation was established in the memory of John. Its purpose is to work against youth violence in Sweden, and John's parents went around schools talking about the dangers of getting involved in such violent organisations. What is also disgusting about this case is that John's grave has been vandalised a number of times by neo-Nazis. The cases I cover are very dark, and all of them are incredibly tragic. However, there are some details in some cases that just really get to me. The fact that these four killers bragged about how wide John's eyes were whilst he was being attacked because he was so scared is something that just left me feeling sick to my stomach. This case takes place in the United Kingdom on the 29th of August, 2019. Debbie Leach was a 24-year-old woman who lived in Blackpool. Debbie had Down syndrome and suffered with a number of other health issues. Because of this, she was described as vulnerable and was dependent on her mother, Elaine Clark. Debbie's mother and father broke up when she was just five years old, and Elaine weaponized Debbie against her father, Tom Leach. She would make it incredibly hard for Tom to see Debbie. He made attempts to see his daughter, but Elaine would always find ways to stop it from happening. Visitation would be kept at a minimum. Elaine was Debbie's primary carer. She was registered as her carer and received payments so she would be able to fulfill this role for her daughter. Elaine had three other children, all of them with learning and physical difficulties. It's reported that the social services were very well aware of the family, due to Elaine's parenting. Those who knew her, even close family, viewed her as a selfish and lazy mother. Elaine and her children moved to Leeds in 2014, and then to Blackpool in 2016. It's reported that whilst living in Leeds, Debbie attended a care centre, went to college, had plenty of friends, and had a boyfriend. She was described by a support worker as shy, but was outgoing when she got to know someone, and by all accounts, was somewhat happy. When they moved to Blackpool in 2016, Elaine did not allow Debbie to go to a new daycare centre, and Elaine stopped providing as much care, despite receiving enhanced benefits for caring for Debbie. In April of 2018, Debbie had a checkup from her GP. The GP became deeply concerned for her well-being when he noticed she had Norwegian scabies, a condition known to be associated with neglect. Debbie received treatment and was discharged. A follow-up appointment was required and set up, but Elaine did not bring Debbie in for the follow-up. Because of this, the hospital made a safeguarding referral to adult social services. However, nothing came of this, despite the concerns that Elaine was a neglectful carer before this even occurred. In autumn of 2018, social services began investigating Elaine due to her other daughter and grandson, who lived in her home with her too. The home was found to be an inadequate standard for them to live in. The court documents described the filthy conditions of the home. Whilst this was being investigated, a file was also opened for Debbie as they found that she was not registered to access a care centre. These care centres provided much relief for Elaine, allowed social services to keep a better eye on her, and would give Debbie a much needed social life. However, Elaine never followed up with the meetings that were set in place. There was a reason for this. The neglect had gotten much worse, and Elaine didn't want people to see the deterioration of Debbie. In 2019, family members and friends who visited Elaine's home saw the condition Debbie was in. Debbie had scabs on her body and had lost a considerable amount of weight. Debbie was known by those who knew her for her long hair, which she kept in good condition. Those close to her would later describe how she would often brush it to keep it looking perfect. But due to her clearly receiving an inadequate amount of nutrition, her hair was now short, thin and scraggy. Upon seeing Debbie in such a condition, the family expressed their concerns to Elaine but these concerns were simply dismissed. In April of 2019, relatives came over again. 
They asked where Debbie was, but Elaine just told them that she was unwell and that no one was allowed to go into her room. Although, Elaine's niece didn't listen to this. She instead snuck away and entered Debbie's bedroom. What she found horrified her. The room was dark, untidy, and had a horrid smell. The niece walked further into the room to find Debbie in bed. She told Debbie to get up and to come downstairs. Debbie was incredibly frail. She was able to get up, but with great difficulty. Debbie struggled to walk as she made her way downstairs to the other relatives. She was crying. Her clothing was heavily soiled and appeared to be rotten. Elaine's sister told her that if she did not sort out Debbie's condition within the next two weeks, she would report her to the authorities. In the weeks that followed, Elaine assured her sister that Debbie's condition had improved. But this was a lie. In July, a party was held for Elaine's son. Relatives were told that Debbie was in her room and did not want to see anyone. They didn't believe a word of it and they went to go and see Debbie in her room. As soon as they entered, they were hit by an appalling stench. Plates full of rotten food and dirty nappies surrounded her bed. Her skin was scabby and sore. The family confronted Elaine, but she rejected their concern. The family would later say that they could hear Debbie crying out for her mother, but Elaine didn't go to her. They told Elaine that Debbie would die if she was left in those conditions for much longer. The family contacted social services, a safeguarding alert was sent to the family's GP who visited that very evening. Elaine realized that they had called the authorities, so she quickly got Debbie out of her bed and brought her into the shower. With hot water and soap, she began to clean Debbie's skin. Her skin was covered in large sores and rashes. The hot water and soap entering these wounds would have been incredibly painful. Debbie's siblings could hear her screaming in agony. Now clean, she dressed Debbie in oversized clothing to hide her frail frame. She managed to get her looking somewhat presentable before the doctor arrived. There was a knock at the door. Elaine greeted the doctor who came in to check on Debbie's well-being. She told the doctor that Debbie was having some trouble controlling her bowels and bladder, so she had given her nappies to wear. She said that her family had seen Debbie before her nappy had been changed and that this was the reason for her being dirty. Elaine told the doctor that her family had overreacted and that there was nothing wrong. The doctor noticed some sores and some dry skin, but he did not diagnose scabies at the time. He left and no further action was taken. On the 1st of August, a prearranged visit occurred. Because these visits were prearranged, Elaine had time to clean Debbie and tidy her room so the authorities would not suspect a thing. Social services noted that Debbie did appear to be unwell, but noted that there were no serious concerns. It wasn't uncommon for Debbie's siblings to hear her crying. They would ask Elaine why their sister was upset, but Elaine just told them that Debbie was attention-seeking and to ignore her. Neighbours would also later say that they could hear Debbie crying. She could be heard shouting, Mummy, Mummy, in her final days. These neighbours spoke with Elaine, but she just told them that Debbie was ill and to not worry about her cries. It would be on the 29th of August 2019 that Elaine called the emergency services to report that Debbie had been ill for a while and had passed away. A medical team was sent to Elaine's home. She told them that Debbie had not been eating or drinking for the last few days and that she had found her dead in her room. The medical staff began walking up the stairs and entered into Debbie's bedroom. Immediately, they were hit with a foul odour. Debbie was lying on the floor in an unnatural position. Rigor mortis had set in. She was surrounded by her own feces. Maggots were found on the floor and near to Debbie's body and her clothing was rotten. The medical staff couldn't believe the state Debbie's body was in. It was obvious that she had been neglected to an extreme degree. Debbie's face was covered in so many scabs that she was no longer recognizable. Her once luscious hair was incredibly thin and large amounts of her skin was missing due to ulceration. The scabies mites had been allowed to breed and multiply, reflecting an infection that had taken some time to develop. 
The pathologist determined that the cause of death was severe emancipation and neglect with extensive and severe scabies skin infection. It said that her skin looked like raw flesh and was described like something out of a horror movie. Those who conducted the autopsy said that as they cut away her clothing, bits of skin came away with it, as her flesh and clothing had fused together, and mites were found crawling all over her back. According to medical records, Debbie usually weighed around 10 stone, which is 140 pounds or 63 kilograms. At the time of her death, Debbie weighed just 3 stone and 10 pounds. This is 52 pounds or 23 kilograms. She was described as just skin and bone. Elaine was questioned by the police. She lied and told them that she had done everything she could for Debbie, but that she was ill and was refusing food. The police didn't buy a word of this. She was arrested and charged with manslaughter. Debbie's father Tom didn't find out right away about his daughter's death. Instead, he saw that she had died in a Facebook post. When he inquired further, he found out about the horrific way his daughter had died. Tom would later say that he was not allowed to give Debbie a decent burial. This was because Elaine was allowed to make arrangements. He told the media, I managed to get half of her ashes and I buried her in a local church right next to my dad. At least I was able to do that for her. Tom went on to say, Every time she saw me, her face lit up. All I can do now is try to remember the good times, but the good times have been mad forever by what happened. Before the trial, Elaine pleaded not guilty and tried to claim that she was innocent. There was overwhelming evidence that she had purposefully neglected Debbie and watched her slowly die in agonizing pain and misery, helpless to save herself. Ten days before the trial would take place, her lawyer urged her to change her plea to guilty. Realizing that this would give her a far more lenient sentence, she agreed. Elaine pleaded guilty. During the trial, Elaine spoke about her troubled upbringing as a means to justify her poor parenting skills and the neglect of Debbie. However, no real explanation was ever given. Elaine never gave a reason as to why she treated her own daughter in such a cruel way. When Elaine tried to pin all of her behavior on her upbringing, the judge told her that this does not offer an excuse for the way she allowed Debbie to die. Evidence was presented which showed how Debbie's condition deteriorated over many months. They showed how Elaine prepared Debbie for the pre-arranged visits from the doctor and social workers so that she appeared to be in better condition than she actually was. There was plenty of opportunity for Debbie to be saved, but instead Elaine tried her best to cover her tracks to allow her to continue to neglect Debbie. She obviously knew how to care for Debbie, well enough to present her in an acceptable condition to the doctors, but once they left, she went right back to tormenting and torturing her daughter with neglect. The judge overseeing the case said, You were her mother, she lived with you and you were also paid for her care. The failures in your care of Debbie were so grossly negligent as to be criminal. You may be in denial but you cannot pretend that this is not true. The condition in which Debbie was found shows that not only did you not do your best, but that you must have done absolutely nothing to care for her in the last days of her life. Instead, you simply abandoned her to die alone, in pain, and without nourishment in the most awful of physical surroundings. The suffering she must have experienced is readily apparent to anyone who has seen the photographs and read the papers in this case. Elaine was found guilty of manslaughter and was sentenced to nine years and seven months. Following Elaine's incarceration, the Solicitor General called for her sentence to be reviewed, as she believed it to be far too lenient. However, those who investigated the appeal stated that Elaine's guilty plea, her lack of previous convictions, her own personal difficulties, and the demands placed on her by being the sole carer of four children with additional needs led them to believe that the sentence was fair. Backing up the judge by stating, the judge in this case took the necessary care. Her sentence remarks were lengthy and detailed. She identified and considered all the relevant factors of this very serious case, 
There is no basis which this sentence can be classed as unduly lenient. The effect is that the sentence remains as before. And so, the appeal to lengthen her sentence was rejected, and it's likely that Elaine will only serve a fraction of her sentence. This case takes place in the United States of America on New Year's Eve 2014. Christian Gomez was a 23-year-old man who lived in Oldsmar, Florida with his mother, 48-year-old Maria. In his younger years, Christian was described as being polite, caring, and kind, although when he turned 18, his behavior began to change rapidly. He began to isolate himself and displayed some worrying behavior. He lost his job, stopped taking care of his hygiene, but what was most concerning was that his family would often find him standing outside in the garden talking to himself. He then all of a sudden began acting inappropriately towards his younger teenage sister and would make advances towards her. He did this so often that Maria would no longer allow Christian to be home alone with his sister. Not surprisingly, his sister no longer felt safe at home, so she decided to live with other relatives. From 2009, Christian was arrested three times, twice for resisting an officer without violence and once for disorderly conduct. Worried for her son, Maria took him to a psychiatrist and had his mental health evaluated. Christian was diagnosed with depression, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Christian was prescribed a number of pills to treat his issues. However, he would often refuse to take them, causing his mental health to spiral further. Christian would spend the vast majority of his time in his room, isolating himself from his family and former friends. His family would also find him sitting in the garden with his Bible, talking to the stars. To keep his behavior under control, Maria would have to sneak his medication into his food and drinks. This was the only way she would be able to get him to take it. Although, despite Christian taking the medication, his behavior was still not under control. Maria took Christian to various mental health professionals. All they would do would offer different combinations of pills at different doses. Maria tried her best to get him put into some kind of facility where he could be treated for his issues with people who would be able to care for him properly. Maria was able to get Christian a therapist. Christian told this therapist that he was paranoid his family were watching him through the television and that at night, he would hear voices talking to him coming from under his bed. He would often struggle to sleep as he had to flip the mattress multiple times a night to see who was underneath. He also mentioned that he felt like he was a burden to his family, especially his mother. Maria did everything she could for Christian. She would leave work early to take him to his mental health appointments and would pay for all of his medication. Her dedication to Christian resulted in her losing her job. However, she held on to the hope that one day, she would be able to get Christian the help he needed to make him better again. Even though Maria did have hope, she was somewhat scared of Christian. Due to hearing voices under his bed, Christian would often sit in the living room during the night in total darkness. Just in case he became violent, Maria would sleep with a knife underneath her pillow. And now, we arrive at New Year's Eve of 2014. Christian also has an older brother named Mario. At this time, Mario was 27 years old and had moved out, but he was home for the festive period. Around this time, Christian had spiraled even further. He was isolating himself more and more, and spent most of the festive period in his room alone. Christian's sister Maria was also visiting for New Year's. At this point, she was 16 years old. Later on in the evening, Maria cooked a meal for Christian, Mario and Maria, and the four of them dined together. Shortly after the meal, Maria dropped her daughter off at work, leaving Christian and Mario alone in the house together. Maria then returned home shortly after, and began moving boxes from the garage into the attic. For the past few days, Maria had needed help carrying some of these boxes. She had asked Christian for help numerous times. However, he always refused. That was until this day, New Year's Eve. Mario would later say that he was sitting in the living room reading a book when Christian approached him without saying a word and just sat and watched him. 
After a few minutes passed, Maria came into the room. She asked Christine again if he would help her take some of the boxes from the garage into the attic. This time, Christian said yes and followed his mother into the garage. Mario then continued to read his book. As he was reading, he heard what sounded like a thud coming from the garage, but no other sounds followed. Not thinking much of it, Mario just went back to reading. Shortly after, a woman named Veronica, who was friends with Maria, came to the house. Veronica had come by as Maria had said she would help dye her hair for her. However, when Veronica approached the house, she was met with Christian, who was standing by the garage door, mopping the ground. She looked down to where he was standing, to see him mopping up what looked like red paint. Veronica didn't think much about this red paint. She simply assumed that at some point, paint had been spilled in the garage, and that Christian was just mopping it up. Veronica spoke with Christian, but noticed that he was behaving very strangely. She pulled out her mobile phone and made a call to Maria to let her know that she arrived and that Christian was acting strange. Maria didn't pick up the phone. Veronica instead sent a number of messages, but again she got no response. Thinking that something was off and that the family may have had an argument, she decided to leave without knocking on the door. Around half an hour had passed since Mario had last seen his mother and he was still reading his book. But then it dawned on him that he had not seen or heard his mother or Christian since they went into the garage. Confused and slightly concerned, Mario walked around the house looking for his brother and mother, but he was unable to see either of them. He then made his way to the garage. Upon entering, Mario was met with a puddle of blood on the ground. A bloody axe was leaning against the wall, and a trail of blood led to outside. Mario followed the trail of blood, which led out of the garage and to the side of the house near some bins. It's there where he found his mother's decapitated body, and Christian was nowhere to be seen. Mario immediately called 911. The police soon arrived, and they were met with the gruesome scene. Mario was in a frantic state, but he did his best to explain the situation to the police. Mario told the officers of his brother's condition, and explained that he believes his brother is the one responsible. The police found Maria's body next to the bins outside of the house, with her head inside one of the bins. The search to find Christian began. Police cars and helicopters searched the nearby area, News of the tragic event spread quickly around the locals, who kept an eye out for Christian. However, it wouldn't be long until he was found. Christian had fled the scene on his bike. A few blocks away from where he lived, Christian saw a group of people in an open garage. He approached them and asked if he could have one of their beers. Noticing how strange he was behaving, one of the men gave him a bottle of water instead. As the man passed Christian the bottle of water, he noticed that his ankles were covered in blood. Christian took the water, got back onto his bike, and left quickly. Only minutes later, a police helicopter passed overhead. Knowing that something was seriously wrong, this man called the police and reported that he had just seen something extremely suspicious. At 8pm that night, officers in a police car found Christian on his bike. They pulled in front of him, resulting in Christian falling off his bike. He was then arrested. Christian was taken to the station and questioned. He was told to explain why and how he killed his mother in such a horrific way. He explained that he had planned the murder of Maria for over two days. He claimed that she had been nagging him to move some boxes, and that he had enough of the nagging. He also said that his brother Mario was home for the New Year's celebrations, and claimed that his mother was giving all of her attention to him instead. The lack of attention he was receiving made him furious. Because of these two combined factors, Christian decided to kill his mother with an axe. When Maria asked him to move the boxes into the garage, he followed her, and once they entered, Christian grabbed the axe that was located in the garage, Whilst Maria's back was still turned, Christian picked up the axe and began to strike his mother repeatedly. To quote Christian, I swung it at her like a baseball bat. 
Maria then fell to the ground. With the axe, Christian proceeded to decapitate his mother, drag her to the bins, and threw her head into the bin. After a very brief attempt at cleaning the crime scene, Christian then got onto his bike and fled the scene. As he described this to the officers, he was emotionless and showed no remorse for what he had done. He simply told them, I finished her. The sheriff spoke with the media and said, In a very calm, cool way, Christian explained what he did, why he did it and what happened and by talking to him, you wouldn't know he had any mental illness. Christian was charged with murder and denied bond. As Christian had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and had also been Baker acted in 2013, his mental health was further evaluated. It was found that he was unfit to stand trial. For over three years, Christian was held in a psychiatric hospital and treated for his condition. At first, he was known to violently lash out at the guards, but according to reports, his condition has since significantly improved, and he was found fit to stand trial at the age of 27. Christian was offered a plea deal, to which he accepted. He was sentenced to 25 years, followed by 10 years of probation and further treatment. Maria's family believed that the state's mental health system failed her, they said it was next to impossible to find any help when their family needed it the most, and mentioned how incarceration was instant following Maria's murder. They made the point that Christian's mental state would have inevitably led him to being incarcerated, either innocently for his safety and for the safety of others, or because he committed a horrific crime. Surely a preemptive measure would have been better than a woman losing her life. Maria's daughter said, my mum loved Christian, she would do anything to protect him, but nobody could ever help us. She went to therapists, psychiatrists and counsellors. Every time something else happened, they would say, up his dose of medication. They didn't take the time to look at Christian and figure out what was really wrong with him. Maria's brother also made a statement. He said, What happens after he's released? Where is he going to go? His sister is afraid of him and I mean terrified. Not only did he kill her mum, but he wanted to make her his woman. Nobody just kills their mum and takes her head. This was different. This was evil. This case takes place in Liverpool, England, on the 13th of November, 1999. Michael Moss was a 15-year-old who lived in Liverpool. He was born in 1983, and it's reported that growing up, Michael wasn't a very academic person. He was, however, very mechanically minded. His mother would later reminisce about the times early in his life where he would dismantle a bicycle completely and then put it back together again just for the fun of it. As he got older, Michael developed a keen interest for motorbikes and became very passionate. Michael was also incredibly close with his father and the two had a very strong relationship. However, his father tragically suffered a brain hemorrhage and Michael was only 11 when this happened. His father was rushed to hospital and managed to make some improvements, although the damage to his brain changed him a great deal. Before the brain hemorrhage, he was described as a good man, but after, he became more aggressive. A brain injury can actually greatly change a person's behaviour, and when Michael and his mother visited his father in hospital, he would often lose his cool. He would swear and even spit at Michael and his mother. Seeing this drastic change and seeing his father deteriorate deeply affected young Michael. His grief would only grow when his father sadly passed away following the brain hemorrhage. He was never able to leave the hospital. After seeing his father's passing, Michael's behaviour began to change. His father's death took a great toll on his mental health. At school, he became too much for the faculty to handle and he was subsequently expelled. 
After being expelled, Michael was placed into a pupil referral unit. This educational unit was called Pinefields and was set up for children with learning and behavioural needs. However, Michael's behaviour was still a big issue. Michael's mother Liz was still grieving from the loss of her husband and was now struggling to deal with Michael's behaviour. As a result of this, social workers suggested to Liz that Michael should move into a children's home. This was done so Liz could have a break. And so, that's what happened. In 1999, Michael moved into the children's home. At this time, he was aged 15. This unit was set up in a way where Michael would be free to leave at any time. This included going to visit his mother or even going out at the dead of night. Michael had settled in well at the pupil referral unit, but also attending this unit were 15-year-olds Alan Bentley and Mark McKeefrey. Both Alan and Mark were friends and had been expelled from their previous school. The two were the school bullies and had badly beaten up another pupil, causing him serious injury. And because of this, they too were sent to the unit. Despite being the school bullies, the two had never committed any serious crimes outside of school and neither had a criminal record. However, Mark and Alan continued to bully pupils at this referral unit too. Michael decided to keep his distance, but he still remained friendly with them. Another pupil then joined this unit, 16-year-old Graham Neary. Graham quickly became friends with Alan and Mark. Alan also had a girlfriend, but in October of 1999, she ended their relationship to be with Michael. This greatly angered Alan. He would often tell his friends that he wanted to stomp all over Michael's head and kill him. Alan, however, did not act right away. Instead, he thought of ways to get back at Michael. On the 12th of November, 1999, Alan had his friends over at his house to celebrate his birthday. These friends included Mark McKeefrey, Graham Neary, and another friend named Neil Breslin. The four watched the movie Reservoir Dogs, shared a bottle of vodka and some cider, and all of them became somewhat intoxicated. Whilst they were all drinking, Alan brought up the situation with his ex and Michael and began talking like he usually would, stating that he wanted nothing more than to beat Michael up for taking his girlfriend away from him. The more alcohol that was consumed, the more Alan wanted to take action. He then devised a plan. At around 1am that night, which was now the 13th of November, Mark made a call to Michael, who was in his room at the children's home. Mark knew of Michael's passion for motorbikes and used this fact to lure him. He told Michael to come and meet him to check out a new motorbike. Michael agreed and told the workers at the children's home that he was going out. The workers told Michael that it was late and that they didn't think it was a good idea to be leaving at this time. But Michael was in no obligation to stay. He could indeed come and go as he pleased. And so, Michael set off to meet Mark at 1.20am. The two had planned to meet in an alleyway on the outskirts of Liverpool, but waiting for Michael was Alan, Mark and Neil Breslin. The four walked to the park that was nearby, and once at the park, Alan began the attack. He walked right up to Michael and headbutted him, resulting in Michael falling to the ground. He then proceeded to punch kick and jump on Michael's head with both of his feet. At this point, Neil Breslin walked away, but Mark and Alan stripped Michael naked and threw his clothing into a puddle. Now naked, Alan began to repeatedly kick Michael in his privates and slashed his legs with broken glass. It's assumed that this was revenge for sleeping with his ex-girlfriend, and this attack lasted for some time. After this savage beating, Alan, Mark and Neil returned to the house. During this first attack, Graham Neary stayed at Alan's home. The three returned back and spoke to Graham about the beating they had inflicted upon Michael and how they had left him naked. Shortly after returning home, they decided that they were not yet done with Michael. They decided to go back. This time, Neil didn't go, but Mark... Alan and Graham did. 
The three walked towards where Michael was left, and he was still there, laying on the ground. Michael was left in a horrific condition and urgently needed medical attention, but instead of helping, the three began another vicious attack. Mark shouted at Michael, demanding that he stood up at once, otherwise he would smash his face in. Michael tried his best to muster up the strength to get back upon his feet, but the beating he had taken was too much, and he fell back down to the ground. The three then began attacking, kicking Michael in the head, face, and genitals. They also picked up a broken bottle, and began slashing and stabbing Michael. Then, the three pretended that Michael's head was a football. They kept Michael's head still, and took turns kicking him as hard as they could in the face, and joked how they were taking penalties with his head. Alan shouted that he was a famous footballer named Michael Owen, as he took a run up to Michael and kicked him in the face. The three would also play knots and crosses on Michael's back by carving into his skin with broken glass. It seemed that the three took great joy in torturing Michael. Alan then picked up a piece of the broken glass and began hacking into the skin behind Michael's ear in an attempt to recreate the scene from the movie they had just watched, Reservoir Dogs. Michael's ear was not removed, but Alan had made a serious attempt to do so. The totality of the two attacks lasted for nearly two hours. The attackers would later say that for the last ten minutes of the attack, Michael didn't move or make a sound. After they were done, the three left the scene. At 3.31am, Mark McKeefrey made an anonymous phone call to the emergency services and told them that he had found a dead body and told them the location. The emergency services arrived on the scene, although they claimed that they couldn't find any body at the location they were given, and so the emergency services left the scene. At 7.30am on the 13th of November, a person walking their dog came across the body of Michael. They made a call to the emergency services who arrived quickly at the scene. Investigators tried to identify Michael and inquired at the care home where Michael was living as it wasn't too far from where his body was found. Michael was logged as leaving the home but not returning. He also matched the description of the body the police had found. The police acquired a photograph of Michael and compared the image with Michael's body, hoping to make a positive identification. But Michael's injuries were so severe that they weren't even able to identify him. Michael's face had been so disfigured that they even thought the body was not that of Michael. However, a member of the children's home staff went to the scene and was able to identify the body as Michael. Meanwhile, Michael's mother Liz was at home listening to the radio when she heard the news that the body of a male had been found in a park. And then, she noticed police cars pull up outside her home. Liz knew instantly why the police were there. They told her the devastating news that Michael had been killed in a horrific attack. Shortly after the discovery of Michael's body, Graham, accompanied with his mother, came into the police station to confess. Graham claimed to have felt a great deal of remorse for what had happened to Michael, he told the police what had happened and named Alan Bentley, Neil Breslin, and Mark McKeefrey. Graham said that he did take part in the attack, but claimed that he only participated because he was scared that if he didn't, Alan and Mark would attack him too. He spoke to the police about how he kicked Michael in the face, not because he wanted to, but because he was filled with fear. Both Mark and Alan were arrested. It's reported that Graham did actually show signs of genuine remorse. He spoke to the police and answered every question they asked. Both Mark and Alan, however, denied even taking part in the murder. And tragically, because they refused to confess, this meant that DNA evidence had to be uncovered to build up a strong enough case against the two to make sure they were convicted. This meant that Michael's body was sent away for five post-mortems, something that deeply affected his mother, Liz. Whilst the four were in custody, the police searched their homes. 
Inside Alan's home, they found a comic strip. The comic strip had been drawn by Alan, and it featured himself and Michael and illustrated the murder in great detail. Michael's post-mortems showed that his injuries were just beyond horrific. Both of his cheekbones had been fractured, with complete separation of the nose from the facial skeleton, and fractures extending to both eye sockets. Michael had ten broken ribs and a broken neck. There were ten separate areas of bruising to the face and head, and fifty to the body. Michael's body had 48 separate cuts from the glass and a deep gash to the back of his ear. Individually, the slashes and cuts were not deep enough to kill Michael, but the sheer amount of them caused significant blood loss. It was determined that Michael had passed away during the second attack from a broken neck. The attackers had continued to stomp and slash Michael's body even after he died. At the crime scene, the police had found the broken bottle and glass that was used on Michael. On this glass, they found fingerprints that matched with Alan, Mark, and Graham. Because the boys had stomped on Michael, they left trainer imprints on his body. These imprints were cross-referenced with their trainers, which brought up a positive result. Along with other pieces of forensic evidence, the police had enough to charge Alan, Mark, and Graham with murder and the trial would begin in July of 2000. Before the trial, Neil accepted a guilty plea of violent disorder in regards to the first attack which he was present at, and he was not charged with murder due to him not being present in the second attack. The killers tried to make the preposterous claim that Michael had asked them to beat him up so he could claim for criminal injuries compensation and that they could all split the money. This claim was dismissed as nonsense, and the evidence found against the three was overwhelming. Mark, Alan, and Graham were all found guilty of murder. It said that during the trial, Graham showed signs of remorse. Mark and Alan, however, did not. Both Mark and Alan were sentenced to a minimum term of 10 years in prison, whilst Graham was sentenced to 9 years. All three have since been released. I am unaware if any of them have been arrested for other crimes. I did, however, find that Neil Breslin has been convicted for other crimes. In one of these instances, Neil, along with an accomplice, tried to rob a family at knife point in their home during the night. The home belonged to an 80-year-old woman named Winfred and her 82-year-old husband. On this night, their son was also staying with them and was sleeping on the couch. Neil and his accomplice broke in and held a knife to their son and told him to remove his jewellery. Although Winfred was having none of it and she went to the kitchen and retrieved a 15 inch carving knife. It is genuinely reported that Winfred said to Neil who was holding a 10 inch blade, you call that a knife, and pointed the knife at his stomach. Neil along with his accomplice fled from the scene. Winfred would later say, I managed to jam the second man's foot in the door and I threatened to put the knife through his foot, but he struggled and got away. Neil was sentenced for this crime in 2006 and following his release, he was convicted again for smashing his girlfriend's window. The case of Michael Moss has been dubbed the Reservoir Dogs Murder due to the influences the film played in the attack. It's important to say, however, that although the movie inspired some of the graphic things done to Michael, there is no link between violent movies and crime. Michael's mother Liz has two other children, and she is a grandmother. She has stated that she loves being a grandmother, but also longs for the day that she can once again be with her son. This case takes place in the United States of America on the 14th of February 2017. Ellie Tran was a 35 year old woman who lived in Virginia. She was a mother of one and was described as a wonderful and caring mother. Ellie had a boyfriend, a man named Joseph Vincent Molino III who was the father of her child. Shortly after becoming pregnant with their child, Ellie told her family who lived in Vietnam. 
She was a rather culturally traditional woman and wanted her parents to play a major role in her child's life. So she invited her parents to come to America and to live with her and Joseph. Joseph, however, was not so keen on this idea and made his opinions very clear. After the child was born, Joseph became incredibly controlling. Ellie's friends would later say that the couple constantly argued, especially about the living arrangements. In July of 2016, Ellie pressed charges against Joseph after he attacked her in front of their two-year-old daughter. In the criminal complaint that was filed by Ellie, she said, My boyfriend scared me. He told me he will put me under the ground behind the house. She also wrote about the attack, stating that Joseph had grabbed her by the neck, restrained her arms and feet, and hung her upside down with her head almost touching the ground. After describing the attack, Ellie said, He did that to me several times in front of my daughter. My daughter was so scared, and she cried and screamed. The two ended their relationship, and Ellie found a place to live with her parents and daughter. Now a single mother, Ellie began working as many hours as possible to support her daughter and parents who were looking after the child while she worked. However, due to what Joseph had done, Ellie became worried that he may come for her. One of Ellie's friends would later say that she would struggle to sleep due to the fear that Joseph may attack her in the night. Due to the breakup, a nasty custody battle ensued. Whilst Ellie would work, Joseph made several attempts to break into her new home. This resulted in Ellie having to install a number of CCTV cameras to deter him from doing so. On the 4th of December, at around 7pm, Ellie was leaving work. She got into her car and prepared to set off. But, just as she did, a person backed into her car. This person then exited their vehicle, threw some kind of liquid at her, and fled. Thankfully, Ellie had turned her head away at the right time. The liquid that had been thrown was acid and had begun to destroy her hair. Ellie was taken to hospital and she was not seriously harmed. The person who had done this was dressed in women's clothing and was wearing a wig. Ellie believed that this person was Joseph and had used a disguise. Eventually, Joseph found a new girlfriend. On a trip to China, Joseph met a woman and the two began a relationship. Despite this, his stalking of Ellie didn't stop and he continued to harass her. On the 14th of February 2017, Ellie finished work, got into her car and drove to her home in Virginia Beach. CCTV footage, which was later recovered, showed her pulling up outside her house. Ellie exited her vehicle and began walking towards her door, but hidden and waiting for her to come home was Joseph. As Ellie walked towards her door, Joseph emerged from his hiding spot, ran towards Ellie and plunged a needle into her skin. The needle was filled with cyanide. After injecting Ellie, Joseph quickly fled from the scene. Ellie began to scream for help. Her mother came out to help her and called the emergency services. When she came outside to assist her daughter, she looked across the street and saw who she believed to be Joseph. Ellie told the emergency services on the phone that Joseph was responsible. Within minutes of being injected by the deadly poison, Ellie lost consciousness. The paramedics soon arrived on the scene and Ellie was rushed to hospital. The medical professionals did everything they could to try and save her, but tragically, she was pronounced dead the following day. Her cause of death was ruled as cyanide poisoning. The police began to work right away to find who had done this. Ellie's mother told the police that she believed the man who injected Ellie to be her ex-boyfriend, Joseph. And so, Joseph was brought in for questioning, and he denied having anything to do with the death of Ellie. He claimed that on the night of the attack, he was over 100 miles away visiting family. Upon learning this, they checked out his mobile phone location. His mobile phone record showed that his phone had pinged to a tower in Victoria like he stated. However, no calls or messages were sent from the device, suggesting that he may have thought of this and left his mobile phone at this location in order to have some kind of alibi. The amount of time that the phone was unused was enough time to carry out the attack. 
It wasn't clear if Joseph was the person in the footage, so one of the first things that the police looked at was his computer. Upon searching his devices, investigators found a number of sinister Google searches. They found all kinds of questions about cyanide, the poison that had killed Ellie. How to get cyanide, how long does it take to kill, and what happens when it is injected were all searched on his device. When searching his purchase history, the police found that Joseph had bought an antique stainless steel syringe from Etsy for $68 and had it shipped to a different address. This address was a restaurant that Joseph was known to frequent. They also found that he had booked flights to China. With this evidence, Joseph was charged with the murder of Ellie. Two months before the trial began, Joseph waged a hunger strike, which resulted in him losing over 40 pounds. The trial began in 2018. The prosecution asked Joseph, did you kill Ellie? To which Joseph replied, absolutely not, sticking to the story that he was over 100 miles away at the time. When asked about the searches on the computer, Joseph denied making them or buying the syringe. He said that the computer that was used belonged to his cell phone repair business and that there were at least six others who had access to it, and also claimed that he had never even heard of the website Etsy. However, as I said earlier, the syringe was delivered to a restaurant that Joseph was known to go on a regular basis. A co-owner of this restaurant said he saw him walk out with a package that was delivered there. This package was the syringe. Court documents also showed that Joseph had been sending coded letters to his mother before the trial. In these coded letters, he told her to pressure the witnesses into retracting their statements. These included Ellie's mother, the restaurant co-owner who saw him pick up the syringe, and one of Ellie's neighbours who identified him as the attacker. He also gave instructions how to fake chat logs in order to create another alibi. Joseph also convinced other inmates to make calls for him. This inmate came forward and told the police that Joseph had confided in him and said that he was instructing people how to testify in court. In other conversations with the informant, Joseph made references to using a hitman, which he referred to as ordering a pizza. An FBI specialist testified about the letters Joseph had sent to his mother and girlfriend. He had decoded them in under 15 minutes and highlighted how Joseph had planned to get away with the crime. In one letter, Joseph wrote, Another thing, I need you to forge some paperwork together, getting someone to say they saw me on the 14th of February. Joseph's alibi was checked out. It turned out he was actually visiting family. However, they could only account for seeing him on the morning and later on at night when he had supposedly finished work. Ellie's mother cried hysterically as the footage of Ellie's ambush was played for the jury. Following the footage being played, she testified that Joseph was the one responsible. It took jurors just 15 minutes to determine that Joseph was guilty. When it came time for Joseph to be sentenced, he was wheeled into court in an upright wheelchair covered in a blanket. He was foaming at the mouth, rocking from side to side and was unresponsive. It said that he was suffering from a condition brought on by extreme stress. Joseph was sentenced to life in prison and was fined $100,000. Ellie's family have said that one of the most difficult parts has been trying to answer the questions posted by Ellie's now three and a half year old daughter, Jolie. Jolie witnessed her mother after the attack as she lay on the floor of her home in extreme pain. Ellie's sister said, I feel heartbroken. I don't know how to answer her when she asks where her mum is. I told her that her mother is now in the sky. She went on to say that on one occasion she took Jolie to the park, but the young girl kept looking around. She said that she was looking around for her mother, waiting for her to come to the park. This case takes place in Australia on the 12th of January 2016. Karen Chikuti was a 49-year-old woman who lived in Worley, Victoria. She was a mother of two and worked as a manager at the nearby city council. 
Karen was described as popular in her local community. Those who knew her thought very highly of her. On the 12th of January 2016, Karen attended a local pub. She left this pub at around 7.20pm. Karen was divorced. She and her ex-husband had a good relationship after the divorce. The situation was described as amicable. And at this time, her two teenagers were staying at their father's house for the week. So she made her way home to an empty house. But this would be the last time that she was ever seen alive. Karen never showed up to work the following day. According to those who knew her, this was very out of character for her to do. Concern grew as more time passed, with Karen still not showing up or responding to calls. Worley is a town 200 kilometers away from Melbourne, and at the time had a population of around 360 people. With it being such a small community, the news travelled fast, and with Karen being highly respected, pretty much everyone shared the concern. The police were notified and a search was soon underway to help locate Karen. When the police went to her house, the lights had been left on and her bag and purse had been left at home, but her mobile phone was missing. But very soon after Karen's disappearance, her neighbour, Michael Cardamone, came forward to the police and told them that he had seen Karen on the 12th of January at around 9pm. Michael had a disgusting past and had recently been released from prison in 2015. He had been found guilty of SAing a 15 year old girl and at this time he was on parole for the crime. Karen wasn't overly fond of Michael for obvious reasons. She was well aware of his crimes and he was a prolific user of illegal substances. It wasn't rare for her to find used syringes near his property, among other articles. Michael told the police that Karen had come over to his place asking for some cherry tomatoes at around 9pm. The police checked Karen's fridge and they did indeed find the cherry tomatoes that Michael had spoken of. Of course, the police began looking at those close to Karen. One suspect was her ex-husband, but it soon became clear to investigators that he played no part in her disappearance. The other suspect that the investigators believed could be responsible was Michael due to his strange story about Karen needing tomatoes so late at night. It was on the 14th of January that evidence pointing to something sinister came to light. Her burnt out cow was found 20 kilometers away from where she lived. An urgent search is underway after the suspicious disappearance of a mother of two in Victoria's northeast. Grave fears are held after her car was found burnt out. Crime reporter Alexis Daish. A mother missing, her car incinerated and her mobile phone nowhere to be found. I strongly suspect that there is someone or some others involved in this disappearance. Karen Chikuti is a mother to two teenage children and a hard-working manager at the Wangaratta Council. When she didn't turn up to work, colleagues knew something was wrong. At 5.30pm, she headed to her local pub just down the road from her home. She went on her own, staying until 7.30pm. It's the last confirmed sighting in what's now a suspicious missing persons case. On the 16th, four days after the disappearance of Karen, Michael contacted his solicitor and told them that he had been kidnapped. However, Michael was located and arrested in Ringwood, a suburb of Melbourne, on the 17th of January. He told the police that he had been kidnapped by a Lebanese gang who had been targeting him and Karen. He claimed that this gang had made a number of phone calls to him stating that they would hurt him and his family, and was adamant that this gang was responsible for the disappearance of Karen. The story that Michael had told the police seemed to be too far-fetched, they didn't believe a word he was saying. Michael then told them that the kidnappers had told him where they had buried her body, but threatened him at gunpoint not to say anything about the killing. Michael then led the police on a search for Karen's body, using the directions he claimed the killers had given to him. On the 18th of January, Karen's body was found off a track down Coppers Creek Road, and her body was in a truly horrific state. She had been badly beaten, her body had been run over, and she had been set on fire. An autopsy was conducted on her body. This revealed even further horror. As well as being burned alive and horrifically beaten, Karen had also been injected with amphetamines and battery acid, and once she had been killed, her body had been run over with a large vehicle. 
On the 19th of January, Michael was charged with the murder of Karen. Since the police didn't believe Michael's first story, he decided to come up with another tall tale. As I said earlier, Karen's car was found and it had been burned. Well, Michael had acquired help from a friend named Eddie George. George had assisted in destroying the car, but he believed he was doing it for insurance fraud. He had absolutely no idea that Michael had committed a horrendous murder. Because Eddie had assisted Michael, he tried to pin all of the blame on Eddie. He said that he was the one who had actually killed Karen. The police didn't believe this story either, but after the police spoke with Eddie, he agreed to testify against Michael in court. Michael was then made aware that Eddie was planning to testify against him. After hearing this information, Michael devised a plan to silence Eddie. In the meantime, the news of Karen's death was announced, which of course deeply disturbed the community. Karen's funeral was held in February, and literally hundreds of people attended. Whilst in remand, Michael began talking to a friend in prison. He told this fellow prisoner that he had indeed been the one who had killed Karen, and went into detail about what he had done and why. He said he had wanted to sleep with Karen for a while and that he had tried building a rapport with her, but she had rejected his advances. He also told this prisoner that Eddie George had no idea about the murder and that he had tricked him into helping him dispose of Karen's car. So this is what happened to Karen. Michael went to Karen's home at 9.30pm on January the 12th, 2016, knowing that she would be alone. Karen was watering her vegetable garden on the night when Michael began to attack her. He was able to sedate her with horse tranquilizer and tied her up with rope and duct tape. During the next hour, he forced her to ingest a small amount of animal tranquilizer and amphetamines and left her bound and gagged for hours in his shed. Michael then left the property and purchased some illegal substances and consumed a significant quantity, mainly meth. Michael returned in the early hours of the 13th of January and dragged Karen into his car. He drove to the Lake Buffalo area and it's here where he brutally ended Karen's life. He essayed Karen before savagely beating her. The autopsy showed that she had six broken ribs and a fractured skull. And at some point, Karen was also injected with battery acid. The fear and pain she must have experienced is just beyond words. But then, if that wasn't enough already, Michael doused Karen with petrol and set her alight. And the autopsy showed that she was still alive when she was set on fire. After Karen was dead, Michael got into his car and drove over her body in his 4x4 vehicle. Following this, he left her body and went to a car wash to wash his car a number of times over. At some point too, Michael also went over to Karen's home and placed the cherry tomatoes in the fridge. This was done as a way to corroborate his story that he would later tell the police. The container of tomatoes was examined by investigators. It was found that the fingerprints on the box matched with Michael's. Karen's fingerprints were nowhere to be found. After cleaning his car, Michael got help from Eddie to burn Karen's car. Upon hearing the graphic details of Karen's death, this fellow inmate that Michael had confided in spoke with the police and told them the gruesome story. And the story seemed to match up with what the autopsy report had indicated. As Michael was in jail, he spoke with his mother and the two began plotting. Michael was able to get the details for a murder for hire whilst in jail and wanted to use their expertise to kill Eddie before the trial could take place. It was during coded conversations on the phone and in prison visits that Michael and his mother would plan. They were able to contact this hitman named Matty Thompson. Together, the mother and son worked out a plan to pay $25,000 for the hit job and used the word Noki for a code word for cash. Although, little did the mother and son know that the hitman was actually an undercover officer. On the 23rd of March 2016, Michael's mother Maria handed a package with $9,000 cash to another covert operative. Michael and his mother had instructed this hitman to make it look like Eddie had taken his own life. He was told to force Eddie to create a false confession letter for the police to find. 
and that this letter should contain an admission of guilt that he killed Karen and that Michael had nothing to do with it. Six days later, the undercover officer told them that the job had been done. Michael told Matty Thompson to show his mother a photograph of the body as proof that Eddie had actually been killed in the way he specified. The undercover officer then asked Michael if his mother would be able to handle seeing a photograph of a dead body. Michael replied and said that she would be absolutely fine. Two months later, Maria was also arrested. She was charged with perverting the course of justice. Michael was also charged with the attempted murder of Eddie George. Shortly after his mother was arrested, Michael pleaded guilty to the murder of Karen. However, this was not a sign of remorse. It's believed that Michael only changed his plea to guilty to secure his mother's release. It was motivated by self-interest. The trial would begin in 2017. The horrors of what Karen endured was read out to the court. The account of what happened shocked even the most seasoned officers and law officials. The judge overseeing the case stated that they had never come across a case so twisted. It said that Michael showed no signs of remorse for what he did, and this didn't go unnoticed by the judge. The prosecution stated that the crime was so cruel and so horrific that a step towards mercy or parole was too much, and that he should serve the rest of his life behind bars with no chance of parole. The judge said, I have never declined to fix a minimum term, but this is a shocking case. The judge added that he was troubled by the fact that Michael had not provided an official reason as to why he killed Karen, nor had he shown any remorse. The prosecutor told the judge, This crime falls into the worst category, and highlighted how Michael's chances for rehabilitation are virtually non-existent. Michael was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The sentence handed down by the judge in August of 2017 was a landmark decision in the state of Victoria. Never before had a murderer who pleaded guilty and did not have any prior convictions for murder been denied the chance of parole. Michael's mother Maria, who was 78 at the time, was sentenced to the 141 days that she had already served in jail since her arrest. The judge ruled that she was just another victim of his manipulation. Michael's lawyer claimed that the sentence was excessive and has since tried to appeal his sentence. Thankfully, however, Michael has been told that he has no right to appeal his sentence, and the Court of Appeal judges labelled him an unfeeling sociopath. The case of Karen is one of the cruelest I have ever come across and it is regarded as one of Australia's most gruesome and disturbing. The fact that Michael got life in prison without the possibility of parole in Australia speaks to the absolute horrors that he was and is capable of. This case takes place in the United Kingdom on the 4th of May 2019. 17 year old Iman was born and raised in the Greater Manchester area in the shadow of the famous Manchester football stadium. She lived with her mother, two sisters and brother and spent plenty of time with her grandparents who lived nearby. The family were all followers of Islam and they worshipped at the local mosque. Iman was bright. She excelled both at school and in social situations. She had no trouble making friends and was a devoted sister to her siblings. In fact, she loved children so much that she told her mother that her dream was to become a midwife. At the time, there was nothing to indicate that a man wouldn't achieve whatever she set her mind to. But, whilst attending high school at Manchester Academy, she met a boy named Rhett Carty Shaw. After that fateful meeting, Iman's life began to change, and not for the better. At first, he presented himself as a bit of a gentleman. He adored Iman and was protective and caring. But soon, that protectiveness turned into control, and those adoring words became critical and demanding. Her friends would often mention that they had seen him out with other girls, but when she confronted him, he would become violent and deny that anything was happening. After a while, Iman stopped saying anything, fearful that she would upset Rhett. 
It was around this time that Iman's family noticed a change in her as well. Where she was once the center of her friend group, she now seemed to be isolated, and when she wasn't with Rhett, she was all alone. Despite these changes, Iman finished high school with good grades and began to prepare herself for college. With another year of maturity, she realized that Rhett was no good for her, and she decided that she was done with his controlling and unpredictable behavior. She wanted college to be a new start, and that meant getting rid of old baggage. But her plans were short-lived, when just a few weeks after separating from her high school sweetheart, she found out that she was pregnant to him. At the time, she was just 16. A teenage pregnancy was far outside of the hopes and dreams Iman's family held for her. In fact, because of her culture, she had already been promised to another man. But Iman did not want to go along with this arranged marriage. In part, because this man was 13 years older than her. But in her culture, she had little say in the matter. However, a pregnancy did change that. Initially, Iman's mother was devastated by the realization that her daughter had fallen so short of her expectations. But with time, she came round to the idea, and she told Iman that she would support her the best she could. The same couldn't be said about Rhett. Despite being separated, he initially seemed excited to be having a child. As if anything, the idea of having a child offered a new hope to the couple and they agreed they would work through their differences to be positive parents for their child. But the reignited flame was short burning. Once again, a man's friends messaged her to say that they had seen Rhett out with other women while she was at home studying or resting, leaving a man to face the challenges of pregnancy on her own. What she didn't know, that right around the time when she found out she was having Rhett's child, he had begun seeing somebody else. Sarah Mohammed was a fellow student from the high school Rhett and Iman attended, and she had her eyes set on Rhett from the minute they met, and she wasn't about to let anything or anyone get in the way of what she wanted. When Rhett found out Iman was pregnant, he became more distant, and rather than support the mother of his child, he spent his time wooing the new girl in his life. When Iman confronted Rhett about Sarah, he admitted that he was seeing her, and that he would tell her about Iman and the baby once their child was born. Once again, Iman agreed to try and work on their relationship for the good of their child. In May of 2019, Iman gave birth to a healthy baby boy named Keenan. As you can already imagine, Rhett did not attend the birth. The arrival of their child changed everything. Sarah had been intensely jealous of Iman's relationship with Rhett even back when they were at school, but her jealousy turned into a violent rage when she found out that they were still an item. And then when she found out that they had a baby together, her emotions spiraled into a toxic storm of envy and resentment. On the 3rd of May 2019, Sarah told Rhett that their relationship was over. She told him that the trust was gone and that he had let her down in the worst way possible. Rhett begged Sarah to change her mind, and he promised that he would never see a man again. Initially, Sarah refused to change her mind, but then she offered him a choice. She told Rhett that there was something he could do to save their relationship, cut him on out of his life once and for all, and she didn't mean figuratively. The following day, on the 4th of May 2019, Rhett knocked on Iman's door. Iman answered the door to find Rhett standing there holding a green bag. No one else was at home, and after a few minutes chatting about the baby, they went upstairs and slept together. Almost immediately after they were done, the atmosphere in the room changed. Rhett told Iman that he had come over to her house to kill her. He told her that if he didn't, then people would harm his family, unless she took her own life instead. Rhett pulled out his mobile phone and told a man that he needed to record her dying so that the people making him do it would know that it was real. A man was stunned and couldn't tell if he was joking. Then Rhett suggested something. He told a man that if she put on makeup around her neck to make it look like she had been strangled, then maybe they could both get out of this alive. 
Emana agreed, and she used makeup to make it look like her neck was bruised. She lay down on her bed and closed her eyes so Rhett could take a photograph of her. But when she opened her eyes, Rhett was standing above her with a knife in his hands. She tried to reach for her phone to call for help, but Rhett kicked it away from her. Iman began screaming and kicking, and she managed to land enough blows to push Rhett off of the bed. But he was still blocking her escape. Iman used every last bit of energy she had to push him backwards towards the door, and with one final surge, she managed to push him down the stairs. But by the time she came down the stairs behind him to escape, he was back on his feet. He chased her out of the back door and into the garden, and that's when the bloodshed began. Using the knife, Rhett rained down blow after blow into Iman's head, face, neck, and back. Iman had no fight left in her. She collapsed onto the ground with blood seeping from her wounds. Within moments, she lost consciousness. Rhett calmly walked back through the house, picked up his bag, and left through the front door. He walked into Sarah's house and cleaned himself up using Dettol wipes and changed into a new set of clothing. Shortly after this attack, one of a man's siblings came home and found her lying in a pool of blood in the back garden. She called for an ambulance and a man was taken to hospital to receive treatment. Remarkably, she was still alive. In the moments before she was taken in for surgery, she was able to identify her attacker as Rhett. Within hours, a warrant was issued for Rhett's arrest. The police apprehended him as he walked down a street close to Sarah's address. He was carrying two plastic bags which contained his bloody clothing and the knife he had used in the attack. When officers looked at his phone, they quickly realized that Rhett hadn't carried out this violent attack on his own. Whilst he had been the one to go into a man's home and stab her, his text messages indicated that somebody else was involved. There were more than 50 messages between Rhett and Sarah from that day alone. In one message, Sarah said, Hurry up and do it. Video it, then delete it when I see it, please. The police then saw that around the time when Rhett was leaving a man's house, he sent a message saying, I did it to prove that I love you. There was no other way to keep you. Sarah then replied saying, I know, there wasn't. I'm going to protect you at all costs. Investigators then found that Sarah had been seen loitering around Iman's neighborhood all day to keep an eye on the home. When the coast was clear, she texted Rhett that he needed to do what had to be done, and she reminded him that he better not forget to film it to prove he had done what she asked. She said if there was no proof, then she would never take him back. Sarah was arrested the same day as Rhett. Unsurprisingly, they both attempted to minimalize their roles in the attack and began to blame each other. Sarah claimed that she believed Rhett was just going to see a man to break up with her and that she wanted him to film it as proof. She claimed that she never expected Rhett to harm a man. Meanwhile, Rhett claimed that he had been made to attack a man when all he really wanted to do was just talk to her. Their text messages, however, told a different story. In one message, Sarah told Rhett not to do anything stupid, like leaving his DNA behind at the scene of the crime. In another, she asked him, did you get rid of the phone? Rhett's internet search history provided further insight into his intentions too. Just one day before the attack, he googled, asphyxiation, and how long do people get sentenced for murder? At the hospital, the doctors did everything they could to save a man, and thankfully, they were able to do so. They got her into a stable condition despite her horrific injuries. Rhett was charged with attempted murder. He was sentenced to 16 years in jail. Sarah was charged with intentionally encouraging or assisting a person to commit murder. She was found guilty too and was sentenced to 16 years in prison. She has since changed her name to Cairo Mori Akihiro. In the sentencing remarks, the judge noted, 
You are both selfish narcissists who believe that the world revolves all around you. Whilst Iman did make a full recovery from the attack, she continues to suffer from the psychological and emotional trauma it caused. She has said, This incident has dramatically changed my life and the outlook of living. I can't do things I want to do anymore because I'm too scared. I'm scared that someone is going to come after me and finish off the job that Rhett and Sarah both started. I don't trust anyone. As if Rhett the person I loved can do that to me, then anyone can. It's hard for me to move on, because I have his child, and I worry that my son will grow up like his dad and be violent. Sometimes I wake up sweating and screaming in my sleep. I find it hard to breathe because I'm so traumatized. I suffer with headaches that just won't go away. Nighttime is especially hard for me as I am alone with my thoughts and they overpower me. I'm taking baby steps to get my life together. This is something that I never thought would happen to me. This case takes place in Sydney, Australia on the 20th of July, 2019. Jessica Camilleri was a 25-year-old woman who lived in Sydney with her mother. Growing up, her parents had noticed that she was delayed in walking and talking. And later, teachers noticed her delays in reading, writing and mathematics. Over the years, she had been diagnosed by various doctors who all gave various answers to her issues. She had been diagnosed with autism, OCD, depression and ADHD although some doctors believed she had schizophrenia. Jessica was badly bullied at school, she struggled to make friends and she was frequently mocked and teased by her peers, and she would often respond to the bullying with violence. In year 9 in school, Jessica was suspended for biting a boy and pulling his girlfriend's hair. The following year, she attacked a schoolgirl and was expelled. It's reported that Jessica had a particular dislike towards her female peers. In her home life, she would often have conflict with her family members. Following a fight with her parents, she was forced to live with her grandmother, with hopes that this may help to solve the issues. However, shortly after moving in, she attacked her auntie, so was made to go back and live with her parents again. Whilst living at home again, Jessica was constantly verbally aggressive to her parents. The stresses she brought upon her family resulted in her parents breaking up and her father leaving home. Jessica's mother Rita did everything she could for Jessica and supported her despite her husband leaving. Despite the problems Jessica would cause, Rita assured her daughter that she would not be institutionalized. Starting in 2012, Jessica committed a series of assaults. On one occasion, she saw a woman holding her baby. Jessica walked over and pulled the woman's hair. Six other such instances were reported to the police, where Jessica would approach random people and pull their hair. The reasons were usually that the person was looking at her in a way that she didn't like. Jessica would also develop a very strange and disturbing hobby. She enjoyed calling random numbers to harass and threaten people on the other end. The kind of threats she would make was a sign of what was to come. One person who was a victim of these calls was a woman named Natalie Naylor. In 2015, Natalie received 20 phone calls from Jessica, and in these calls, she would threaten to kill Natalie's husband. Jessica would say, I will come over to your door with a knife in my hand and slit your throat myself. I will ram a knife right through your neck and cut off your whole head. She did this to numerous people. Another person was a man named Matthew. For over 12 months in 2018, Jessica would call Matthew's personal numbers and business numbers at least a hundred times a day. In these calls, she would threaten to stab him and cut his head off. Rita was made aware of these very disturbing phone calls. However, despite her trying, she was unable to stop Jessica from placing the calls. Despite Rita doing everything she could for her daughter, Jessica would be constantly rude and aggressive towards her. She would often scream and swear at her, even in public. 
In June of 2018, Jessica's aggression began to escalate further. Her psychiatrist noted that she had very low impulse control and would lash out and act without thinking of any consequences. She was diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder and was prescribed antidepressants and Valium. Although, by December, Jessica declared that she no longer wanted to take any medication. And now, we arrive to July of 2019. At this point, Jessica and Rita lived alone together. Her older sister had moved out and married, and of course her father had left home a number of years prior and Jessica was seeing a therapist for her anger and depression. However, there was little improvement. On the 19th of July, Jessica made a number of phone calls to a random man. She made her usual threats of decapitation and told him that she hopes he gets cancer and dies. Rita learned of this and sought help from the police in an attempt to get Jessica to stop this behaviour. That same day, Rita took Jessica to the station and an officer gave Jessica a caution, instructing her to never call people and make threats ever again. Rita and Jessica then left the station and made their way home together. The following day, on the 20th of July, a young relative of Rita and Jessica's came over to stay with them. This relative was only four years of age, so they are unnamed. Because they were only four years old, Rita needed to provide more supervision, care and attention to the child. But this angered Jessica. She was bitterly jealous of the attention the child was receiving. In the evening, Rita ordered a takeaway for Jessica and the young relative who was staying with them for the night. Soon after, Jessica told her mother that she was experiencing a severe stomachache and needed a doctor. The doctor arrived at around 9.30. Rita let her inside so she could inspect Jessica's symptoms. However, Jessica was on the phone to a fast food restaurant, trying to order a second serving. The doctor would later say that Rita tried to get Jessica to hang up on the phone, but Jessica refused and instead continued to speak on the phone. She began to ask the attendant on the line to tell her that he loved her. The doctor waited for some time, but after around half an hour, it became clear that Jessica would not get off the phone, so the doctor left. She was also sure that Jessica had faked these symptoms. After the doctor left, Rita made a call to her eldest daughter, who was named Christy. Rita told Christy that she was worried for Jessica and believed that now was the time to have her institutionalized. However, this is something that Jessica really didn't want. Rita walked over to grab her mobile phone and began to call the emergency services to have Jessica be taken to a psychiatric hospital. But before she could, Jessica approached her and grabbed the phone. The two engaged in a brief struggle before Rita then made her way to another room to grab a different phone. But Jessica had followed her into the room. Jessica knocked her mother to the ground, grabbed her by the hair and dragged her into the kitchen. She then opened a drawer, pulled out a knife and sat on top of her mother to restrain her. Jessica then proceeded to stab Rita in the face, head and neck multiple times. The child relative who was staying over heard all of the commotion. He went to see what was happening only to witness the horrific sight. This young four-year-old boy bravely took action. He jumped on Jessica and tried to get her to stop attacking Rita and took the lid of a toy box and struck her over the head. Of course, this brave young lad was far too young to do anything to stop Jessica from attacking Rita, but the fact that he tried to do something at that age is incredible. Jessica pushed the child away and slashed his face from his ear to his cheek. The child retreated and due to the horrific scenes he had witnessed, he began to vomit a number of times. It's also likely that Rita was still alive when the young boy had tried to defend her. Jessica had used such force in stabbing her mother that she broke four knives. Each time one broke, she would grab another. In total, Jessica stabbed her mother in the face and head over 100 times and had used a serrated knife to decapitate her. To fully sever Rita's head, Jessica began to twist and pull until it became fully detached. By the time she was done, Jessica was covered from head to toe in her mother's blood. 
She picked up her mother's head and walked to the next door neighbor's home, but she dropped her mother's head on the pavement on the way. Jessica knocked on the neighbor's door and asked them if they could call the emergency services for her. She then turned around and returned home and called the emergency services herself. Here is the call. Hello, this is Alison from Police Emergency. We just received a call from this number. Uh, yes, I need you to get the ambulance and the police out here immediately. To which address? I need you, this is our immediate our life or death situation. Which suburb or town is that in? St. Clair, St. Clair, okay, St. Clair. Okay, so St. Clair, and what's the nearest crossroad, please? Um, what's the nearest, um, listen, can you, can you talk to the neighbour? I'm flustered, can you just talk to him? Oh. Because my hand's bleeding, yeah. Thank you. Can you talk to him? Oh, my finger's broken. I can't. It's alright. Hello? What happened? I don't know. We was just at uh, um, home, but uh, she just uh, uh, came in screaming for help. And when suddenly I opened the door, she said, uh, just help me and call the uh, police or ambulance. And uh, she said to me, uh, she had a fight with uh, her mom, I think. Okay. Um, My mom tried to stab me and yeah, I killed her, I think. So did she just say her mom tried to stab her? I don't know because of the... Yes, yes. Yeah. I don't know. And I, in self-defense, I think I killed her. Yes. Can you tell him to come immediately? Yeah, can, can you please uh, just come immediately, please? Okay, so she believes that she may have killed her her mother? Yes. Yeah, she said like this, yeah. Yes. And where yes. is this where you are at the moment? So, uh, who, uh, me? Yeah, so where are you at the moment? Oh, my, oh. Is she with you at the moment? Yes. Yeah, she's uh, in the front yard of my house. Okay, all right. Uh, so yeah. how old is her mother? Uh, how old is your mother? My mum's dead, I think. So how old is she? 57. 57. 57. So is she not conscious? Nah. I stabbed her because she tried to kill me. Okay, and you didn't check if she was breathing? No, we can't go there. There's a kid in there. Could you come with me, please? No, I can't go. Sorry about that. Yeah, nah. okay. There's a kid, a, a four-year-old kid yeah, on the phone no. in the house. And is her mother severely bleeding? No, because um, uh, we, we didn't go to the, uh, her house, because I'm in, uh, outside of my house, because I can't go there. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay, so do you know what the lady's name is? Can I, my fingers are broken. My yeah, fingers uh, are broken. her mother was uh, just uh, the, um, his name, uh, her name. Jessica Tunnelary. Is that your name? Is that the lady's name who called? Yes, yes. Can I talk to her? Yeah. Um, lady, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, can you tell your name's Jessica? My th my fingers are broken. Okay. Uh, Mum has ha had enough of me because I admit I've been a challenge, and this this ongoing thing's been going for months. And months anyway. Um, she she had enough of me. She grabbed me by the hair and dragged me from my room all the way to the kitchen, and she got a knife and she tried to stab me with it. And I grabbed the knife off her because I thought she was going to stab me, so I stabbed her back. And I was so heated up with anger, I just kept stabbing and stabbing and stabbing her, and I I, I took off her head. Her head is, um, I, I ran to my neighbour, not this neighbour, um, my other neighbour before this one, he's on the other side, he was at work. Uh, I told him to call the ambulance and the police immediately, he's going to do so, but no one's at home because everyone in the family is at work now. Okay. So he wasn't much help, he said, all I can do is I'll call the police and the ambulance to my address and I thought it was going to take a bit of time, so I ran to my other neighbour on the other side. Okay. Um, and I had my mum's head in my hand, I know this sounds insane, but I was taking it for evidence to show the neighbour. In the struggle, in the frustration, I didn't know what I was doing. I cut her head off. I chopped her head off with a knife. Okay. What type of knife was it? Um, th there was all sorts of knives. There was about um, seven knives uh, Seven knives I was stabbing her with. A few of the knives broke. When that knife broke, I got another one and did the same. Where's the knives now? They're all in the kitchen. Every there's blood everywhere. There's blood everywhere. Yeah. And you're outside the house? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, the ambulance and the police have rocked up. Do you want to stay on the phone? No, that's okay. What's your phone number? Officers arrived on the scene to find Jessica standing outside in a nightdress, completely covered in blood. When the police asked what had happened, she told the officers that her mother had tried to kill her with a knife and claimed that she had defended herself. The police apprehended Jessica and inspected the scene. Inside, they found the young four-year-old boy hidden in the living room. He was taken to hospital as the cut to his cheek was rather deep. He underwent surgery for the cut to his cheek and he also had a small cut to his hand. 
But of course, the main damage was psychological. The young boy was deeply traumatised by the events that he witnessed that night. In the kitchen, the police found the lifeless body of Rita. Her head was also located outside the home. Before she was taken away, Jessica pointed to where the head was and asked the officers if they would be able to sew her mother's head back onto her shoulders. Jessica was taken to the station and was questioned further. She said that she had been attacked by her mother and did what she did in self-defense. However, Jessica had no physical injuries. She also only really seemed to care about what would happen to her now and showed little remorse for what she had done. Crime scene investigators began to examine the scene. They were able to determine from the crime scene that Jessica was lying. She had been the aggressor the entire time, not Rita. Rita had over 90 defensive injuries. Her hands had been cut to ribbons. In her final moments, she desperately tried to defend herself from Jessica, but tragically was unable to do so. When piecing together what had happened, they discovered that Jessica had sliced off the tip of Rita's nose and had also used a knife to pluck out both of her eyes. It was clear too that Jessica had held one of the eyes in her hand and squeezed it. Jessica was charged with the murder of Rita. While Jessica was awaiting trial, she was kept in a facility. In this facility, she lashed out at a number of women. She would usually pull their hair, but on one occasion, she poured boiling hot water over an inmate. The trial began on the 30th of November 2020. The evidence of the brutal crime was read to the jury, describing the horrific things Jessica had done to her mother. Jessica's hobbies were also brought up, which included the disturbing phone calls. But it was also brought up that she was obsessed with horror movies, and two movies in particular, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Jeepers Creepers. She was known to watch these movies on repeat. I'm not claiming that movies caused these things to happen, I'm just mentioning what was brought up in court and by the media. A family friend also came forward, and said that Jessica had voiced her concerns about being put into a hospital. Jessica told this family friend that she would rather kill someone than return to a psychiatric hospital. Jessica's defense team brought up the various mental disorders she had that would have impaired her ability to control her anger and emotions. It was concluded that Jessica had an intellectual disability disorder, autism and severe anger issues along with narcissistic features and features of OCD, depression, anxiety, and ADHD. However, the prosecution brought forward evidence from a psychiatrist that showed that Jessica knew right from wrong. When the family of Rita read their victim impact statements to the court, it was reported that Jessica showed little interest in what they had to say. The jury were convinced that Jessica's judgement was impaired by her conditions, and as a result of this, she was found guilty of manslaughter and not murder. Jessica was sentenced to 21 years and 7 months. After being convicted, Jessica spoke with a forensic psychiatrist, and she admitted to him that she attacked her mother and did not act in self-defence. She told the psychiatrist that she hacked her mother like a butcher and described how she twisted her mother's head to fully remove it. Jessica also claimed that the murder was as brutal as it was because she had been inspired by the horror movies she had watched. Since being incarcerated, Jessica has expressed remorse for what she had done, although this does seem to be somewhat disingenuous. As in September of 2022, Jessica appealed her sentence. The result of this appeal is yet to be determined. Jessica's older sister Christy has stated that before the attack, Jessica had all the support she needed. All the support she refused. Jessica preferred the attention her behaviour attracted instead. Christy described her mother as having a heart of gold and always put other people before herself. Others have said that Rita's unconditional love for Jessica was remarkable but that sadly she was blindsided and couldn't see what Jessica was truly capable of.